Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. It's Friday. It's June 9th. There is a lot going on in Idaho today. I am going to be covering all of the motions that just dumped onto the public website leading up to the two gag order hearings today in Idaho. While the media is recording those and they are to be released later, these have been substantial substantially delayed today, which is real annoying, but we're going to do our best to cover everything in those motions that we haven't talked about yet, and then cover what's going on in court as soon as we have feeds from court. Idaho has been real picky about recording things and releasing them later, so we are going to do our best. The morning hearing already concluded without a ruling, but we're going to go over what the judge was signaling and talked about. And then the afternoon hearing is scheduled to start in just about a half an hour. I don't know if we will see anything from that hearing today or not. It's really, really wild. So the media is just, is just, <laughs> it's messing with my stream, streaming schedule today. But I was ready, um, I was ready to talk about these motions anyway, so we're going to do that first, and then we will see what we can do. It's frustrating, but I'm not going to tell you that this is always easy. It's not always easy. It's real frustrating the way that these get dropped later. I was very, very much expecting that they would drop the morning hearing and then do the afternoon hearing and then drop the afternoon hearing. It seems that that's not what's happening which might be because of this judge. This judge does not seem thrilled with the media, and we will do our best. Though Court TV has aired the hearing on their Court TV feed, they have not aired it on their YouTube feed, so we are going to try to grab that and share it with y'all. So, deep breaths, y'all, deep breaths. We're working, we're working around here to uh, work around the issues of traditional media and don't worry chat the mods are on it they are checking for when these get released out into the media there might also be an issue with other news breaking today that everybody's jumping on i don't know indictments something something politics something something Ugh. so that's happening today and that might be slowing down all of the court feed coverage because they have shifted to other coverage. I'm not shifting to other coverage. We are covering this and I'm going to yell about the lack of transparency in Idaho. So let's do that today. All right. I know there's other news happening. If it's not about Idaho, we we're not chatting about it. So with that, we're talking about this. Why? Because I think that we're in a really interesting place to discuss the role of media, the role of legacy media, transparency of the courts, um, what role media plays, if, if this is different now because of social media and TikTok, or if these types of things always existed when you had, um, when you had intense regional interest. So, I think these are really valuable conversations to have. And I think legacy media is trying to figure out how to navigate it. We are trying to figure out how to navigate it. And that is important to me. So let's talk media and these motions and the prosecution talking about like the prosecution's like, yeah, miss me with these cameras. And I get it because I've been there. Like, I've been the trial attorney in court on cases where I definitely don't want the media in court um, just because, like, I don't want them filming me from the side of my face and I don't need to be, like, my job to be open to that kind of public, like, I hate your face type of stuff. Um, so I understand. However, when you're dealing with high-profile cases, it comes with it. But I understand not wanting it. So we're going to talk about that too. Like, what is this, what is the difference here for the rights of the defendant and the rights of the public and, you know, the rights of the attorneys? What, what does that look like? Why would the attorneys be objecting to these sorts of things? And some of those reasons might be because of the case, but some of those also might be like, they really don't want their work on the internet like this because it can interfere with cases and we've seen that in multiple cases that i've covered here live with y'all we've seen um 
like swatting of courts essentially when cases are streamed live and that can be a problem too so yeah it's cheryl's like you're cracking me up today thank you for not mentioning blah 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 look i i tell you all here's what i tell y'all and then we're gonna roll the intro and get into it i tell you all that when you come into a stream and you see the topic of the stream though i might get sidetracked talking about the siren song of chat gpt or the ridiculousness of a Vanderpump Rules reunion. I am not going to sideswipe you with deeply polarizing issues and politics. You're not going to get hit sideways with breaking news that, yeah, it might drive a lot of clicks and yeah, it might drive a lot of views, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. And that's not what I talk about on my channel. I hope to be reliable for you so that you know what you are going to get when you come here. I will be late. I will sing. I will curse, I will make jokes, I will talk about things that interest me, and I will talk about all of it, but I'm not going to sideswipe you with breaking news, and I appreciate that you also, as a chat, don't sideswipe me with breaking news. I want to make sure that when you come here and you sign up for a case, you know what you're getting. You know that today we're talking about Idaho. We're going to talk about the, the motions. We're going to talk about the hearings. We're going to talk about all of it. We're going to talk about the role of media in court, the role of the public in court, the role of social media in court. But I don't want you to ever feel like you are seriously caught off guard, like, holy crap, that came out of nowhere. When we talk about really heavy cases, I want you to know what you're signing up for. I don't want you to find yourself all of a sudden down a rabbit hole that you really don't want to be in because you need to know. And I think that's fair. So you can choose to engage. Sometimes it's okay to choose not to engage in the breaking news of the moment and wait a minute, just wait a beat until it gets processed and know that you can engage with it or to say, I'm not, I don't want to engage with this today. I'm going to take a minute. And, and that's, why, A, I don't like covering politics because it's really, really difficult to talk about the nuance of the law without it getting lost amongst the politics. And I really want you to know truly that when you come here, we absolutely know what we are covering and you know how I make those decisions. And that's what it is. So there's a lot of room to run down that rabbit hole of politics and there's a lot of views to be had in it, but it's not what I want to do. And it's not what I want to cover. And it's not what you're going to see me talking about unless it's tangentially related to our pop culture stuff. Um, a lot of times politics needs space and time to play out and it feels immediate and heavy and big. And I want to cover what I like to cover and what we like to cover together. And I rather build our community one subscriber at a time than worry about chasing down breaking news that everyone else is gonna cover. I'm sure Phil DeFranco will cover stuff today that happened. Great, I'll watch that later. Um, I'm sure that other news outlets will cover it. Great, I'll go watch that later. I don't like to cover it. I don't have the bandwidth to cover it. And I really wanna know what the fuck is going on in Idaho. And if this judge is gonna try to keep cameras out of the courtroom, I want to know. And I can't shift my focus. I Trying to shift back to Idaho after the way my brain is down a rabbit hole of chat GPT yesterday, I'm like, put me on a committee. Like, if you want me to talk about politics, who is making the laws about chat GPT? I would like to chat with them. That's, I would love to get into that. I would love to have those conversations. Where are the legal groups that are having conversations with lawyers about how these tools shape the law going forward? how we deal with the ramifications and remind lawyers that internet personalities are having deep fakes made of themselves. Deep fakes are being weaponized in high schools amongst other things and being able to say, hey, how are we navigating this? That's a conversation I'll have. And that's a conversation with lawmakers. So, you know, sort of political, but that's change. Um, Emily, Phil doesn't upload on Fridays, gotta wait till Monday. How thankful is Phil DeFranco today? Phil's like, fuck yes. I have time to process. <laughs> That's the other thing. I need time to process. And when things are breaking, there's no time for me to process unless it's something we're already covering. Like if there's breaking news in the Rust case, I don't need that much bandwidth to process it because I already know what's going on in the Rust case. That is on my mind. But I don't 
stay that deep in it with politics. I trust certain channels and certain outlets to cover it. And I tune in with those, but I am still, I'm still beguiled. I am beguiled by chat GPT and I am still, I am still reeling from that motion yesterday and the way the language that they used around chat GPT and the way that hit me when they're like beguiled by new technology that was, that was, you know, lying unabashedly to them. I was like, the fuck is happening here? And the fact that these, this lawyer was like, it's, I mean, I made an error, but it's really chat GPT's fault. I'm like, I don't understand what it's like passing off responsibility onto something else because I've often taken blame for myself. I've often taken blame for others. I've often allowed blame to be put onto me that probably wasn't mine. Um, And so I don't know what it's like to so confidently stand up and say, I mean, yeah, I made like a mis- like oopsie, but like really the problem is chat GPT, not me. What the fuck is that like? So I'm still trying to process that because I don't know what living with that audacity is because that's never been um, a privilege that I've had in my life. I have a lot of privileges in my life. That is not one of them. So it's crazy seeing like the quiet part out loud, but I don't think the lawyers knew it was the quiet part, right? So that's fascinating too. So I am just, I am still beguiled. (laughs) And those lawyers haven't been sanctioned yet. The judge is going to issue a ruling. I can't wait to get a hold of that transcript. Like that court reporter, I'm like, take all my money, take all my money, like take my money. I need that transcript. I need the whole thing. So we're going to do that too. And we will go through that transcript. I will live my best life as like a voiceover artist and do a dramatic reading of that transcript. And I cannot wait for it. It's been a long time since I've done a dramatic transcript reading and I can't wait to see what happens. (laughs) So chat, it's so good to see you. Let's talk Idaho, shall we? We've got so many fucking motions. They all just like, they just drop them. And then They don't even, the dates that they say they drop them aren't even the days they pop up on the website. So like time is a construct anyway, and I can't figure out what we're doing. So with all of that, let's hit the intro. Let's go live and let's have a chat. We'll see. Uh, Buckle up. Who knows how long we'll be here today. And um, we'll just, we'll just follow this rabbit hole wherever it takes us today. And hopefully eventually the media will let us watch some of these hearings because I want to see. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not Let's get into it. I'm... Yes, I'm bopping along. Uh, B2, thank you for the incredible gifted memberships. Um, J. Michael, 21 months. It's so good seeing it. It's been wild, um, the growth on this channel. So thank you for that note. And we will get to Super Chats throughout as we get back and forth through these motions and then try to catch up with these hearings as they come. Also, um, the mods are the mods are like modding and keeping an eye on all of the um all of the different hearings so and when they're dropping so we are keeping an eye on that internally so thank you if you see it you can if you see something that looks like it's actually a hearing feel free to tag a mod uh let me know where you're coming in from what you're drinking i have fizzy water with ice which means i'm probably gonna need to put this away so i don't chew ice in your ear because oh my god that is awful and rude um water we're like camped out for the day So we've got all the hydration and it's been a long time since I've been live on a Friday and I'm still kind of reeling from the audacity from yesterday and chat. It, it just, I appreciate all of you also saying thank you. Like knowing that you're coming into a stream and knowing what you're going to get is something that is very important to me. Um, because here, well, my most recent trauma, uh, guardians of the galaxy three, I wasn't aware of what I was walking into and the level of of traumatized I would be. Um, <laughs> the, amount, the amount of crying that would happen, I was like, ah! So 
I want to know what I'm going in for. Is that a neurodivergent thing? I don't know if it is. Is that a trauma response thing? I don't know. So much has happened in my world. I don't know what my quirks are sometimes. But like even going to a new um, a new conference, a new restaurant, a new experience, a new concert venue, I really do want to know what I'm in for. Like, am I going to have to walk up? Like, oh my God, Verizon Wireless. Am I walking up seven hills like this to get to a concert venue? Or is there no parking? Or is it a delightful experience and I can park right there and walk right in? I need to kind of know what I'm in for. And I like having a plan and understanding what I'm in for. So I feel like <laughs> whatever, whatever of my neurospicy and trauma responses that is, I need to know kind of what I'm getting in for. And um, I, I want you to feel that way when you're streaming too, or or when you're here too, that you know what you're in for. Oh my God. Um, I see. Wait, where is it? Injunet said amusement. Mar uh, amusement park map studier me 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 too um i want to look at the menu before i go to a restaurant i want to look at if i'm going to a park to go hiking i need to look at where i'm parking and where i'm going i need to know these things i like to have some idea in advance it's part of why i like going to the same restaurants it's easy to shop at a target like i know what we're doing so that's part of why i let you know how I decide to do things. But I also think the news cycle today has buried these hearings because of the news cycle today. So let's get into all of these motions, shall we? Let's see, what did I cover? I covered some of them real quick. So I'm trying to decide where to pick up these motions. Um, defendant's motion for order permitting Zoom participation, defendant's memorandum on camera during hearings, state supplemental response to defense motions. Okay, defendant's memorandum on cameras during hearings is where we are picking up. Um, so that M's, this is true. Wait, I wanted to pull this comment up and I'm I've law I saw it and then I lost it. Ever research it so much you feel like you've done it and then lose interest? Yes. <laughs> You're like, oh good, it feels like I've been there. I'm good. <laughs> yes, absolutely. The hearing hasn't started yet. No, Stephanie, the morning hearing is done. The afternoon hearing hasn't started yet. And the media has not released the hearings yet. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to go to motions. And that's where we're starting. What did I say we were starting with? I just said it. I forgot. I got distracted. Um, defendant's motion. Where are we? Defendant's memorandum on cameras during hearings. That's where we're starting. So let's start there. Why does my house sound like it's shaking? Because my teen is running down the stairs. Y'all, summertime is interesting. This kid slept for like 15 hours, me telling stories on my teen. Slept for like 15 hours, woke up, walked downstairs, and I was like, holy shit, you're bigger. Like visibly bigger. It happens. It happens sometimes with kids, but it's it's real weird to see. Real weird to see when they are just like visibly taller. It's banana. It's bananas. Um, it's just bananas to experience it. So it's, and it's, it happens less and less the older they get, right? So Court TV is playing the gag order hearing on their website or on their YouTube. Because if they're playing it on their YouTube, we'll just go there now first. Let me take a look. If not, we will go elsewhere. Let's see. Mm. All right, I'm looking. Yeah, it's probably on... He's on right. on their channel channel we'll get there in a minute um we're gonna look at some of these hearings first and then we'll get there so we've got that queued up so don't worry all right i said we were covering the motion regarding cameras that's what we're doing first <laughs> yay we're professionals here delightful all right memorandum on cameras during hearings let's see what the defense has to say about it Brian Koberger buying through their attorneys, J. Weston Logsdon, Chief Deputy Litigation. I love that the title is Chief Deputy Litigation. Chief Deputy Litigation. Koberger has multiple attorneys now. In a case like this, that's not surprising. Issues. This court should limit media coverage of this case to protect Sixth Amendment interest. <sighs> Uh, 
This court should not permit the media to use cameras to permit unfairly prejudicial coverage of Mr. Koberger or harass courtroom participants. I mean, that's fair. No one should be harassed. The internet is also collectively wild. But this happens through print media and newspapers. This court should not permit cameras in the courtroom to distract courtroom participants from the real purpose we are here. I think keeping cameras out is more distracting than having cameras in. Because if the cameras are out, everybody's clamoring for information. Facts. You know how we love those. Oh, dear. Am I in any of these? Good. <laughs> Me. I don't want to cover things in a way that feel exploitative and salacious and clickbaity and end up being complained about. Because A, I don't think it helps anything. And B, I don't think it helps anything. And C, it doesn't match my values and ethics. <clears throat> All right. Koberger's charge and subsequent courtroom proceedings have captured the attention of local and national news art, uh, organizations as well as social media platforms. I mean, everyone. It's captured everyone's attention. The court has previously permitted cameras in the courtroom in regards to this case prior cases prior proceedings. However, given the sensationalized nature of the case, the audiovisual coverage has become material for news outlets and social media accounts to espouse their unfounded opinions. Have you met the internet? The internet espouses their opinions. what they do. However, even if people were just present in court, this would still happen because reporters would, there would be more reporters, by the way, flooding into court. And then those reporters would give all of their opinions and then those would get spun as well. Following each of Mr. Koberger's court appearances, numerous social media posts have been made regarding him through Facebook posts, YouTube, and TikTok videos, and a podcast. Just the one podcast? One. A podcast. That is not true. I have also talked about it on my podcast, Offense. Each video attempts to analyze Koberger's demeanor, I don't do that, by observing his body language from one court appearance and describing him using phrases such as cold iciness. Yeah, I don't do that. It looks like he is just filled with darkness and hate. Well, that is opining on unfounded opinions. And he keeps getting creepier among numerous other phrases. See, this is why I cover things the way I cover things. Oh, so this is sidebar. This is true crime, long crimes. Cold iniciness, Brian Koberger's body language before and after arrest for Idaho murders analyzed. It looks like he is just filled with darkness and hate from whatever TikTok account this is. Um, I don't know what this is from YouTube. Cold iciness. That's probably also long crime because it matches with their podcast. And then Nancy Grace. Um, true crime news. Nancy Grace breaks down disturbing new details released about Koberger. Okay. Um, people are going to talk about him. His face, his eyebrows, his body language. I mean, the man sat in court and people are going to um, continue to opine on it, but they would do that in court. Do you want these? Do you want them all to show up in court? They'll all show up. They'll show up and wait. Argument. This court should limit media coverage of this case to protect six amendment interests. Well, the media, hold, this is why I don't clickbait shit. It's, it's why I don't lean into that. I want to cover what happens in court. If y'all think he looks creepy, you can decide that for yourself. I don't need to tell you that. Y'all can watch it and be like, I think this. Oh, he was sitting there. Oh, he, 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 he's in a no-win situation, by the way. He has to go to court. Anything he does is going to get picked apart. So he has to sit. And that's it. He can basically sit. So that's what's going to happen. But everybody can make their own determination. You don't need my determination. You need to know why he stood silent or what it means to object. You don't need me to tell you what to think. Y'all have thoughts. Y'all are very bright and super intuitive and hydrated. Most of you are good drivers. 
Some of you. Mm. Um, all of you have healthy boundaries and good hydration. All right, let's keep going after we've complimented the chat. <sighs> While the media holds the crucial role of informing the public of criminal proceedings, the right only exists to the extent that it does not impede upon the rights of the defendant and is subject to maintaining fairness in the judicial process. They have been able to maintain fairness in the judicial process in cases much more high profile than this that are picked apart much more by media than this because not all jurors pay attention to TikTok, to, to Instagram, to YouTube, to Facebook. My husband did not see a single thing about the Depp v. Heard case the entirety of the time because he doesn't pay attention. And when I talk about it, he's like, mm-hmm. Knows nothing about this case. Because this is not his world. This is not what he pays attention to. So, you ask him about the like Tennessee snake page. He'll tell me all about the different kinds of snakes and the different seasons that they're active and how high the grass needs to be and whatever. But not this. So you can still find fair jurors. And... People are allowed to have opinions even if you don't like their opinions. I understand that Brian Koberger's attorneys don't like that people are calling him creepy. But also, if that's the worst thing people are saying about Brian Koberger on the internet, his attorneys need, need a reality check on how mean people can be to those engaged in litigation. Calling him icy and creepy is mild. <laughs> it's a mild opinion. Mild opinion. Okay. They're not, and y'all, all of you that are like, hey, what about the First Amendment? The court has to balance. We'll talk about the First Amendment. The defense doesn't give a shit about the media's First Amendment rights. That's my speculation. They care primarily about the defendant's Sixth Amendment rights in their case. They do not care about the media's, the, they do not care about free speech. Like, in this context, I'm not saying like, these defense attorneys hate free speech. Don't, don't, I'm not saying that. I'm saying in this context, free speech is not the concern of the defense team. The right of a free media is not the concern of the defense team. The defense team wants to protect the defendant's rights. The court has to balance the rights of the defendant, the prosecution, and the media, and the public. That's the court's job. The court has to balance all those things. Not the defense. The defense is advocating for their rights. And then the court balances all those rights bumping up against each other. That's the balancing process that the court has to undertake. All right. Mm -mm -mm. A fundamental right of every defendant is the right to a fair trial by an impartial jury established by the Sixth Amendment. We know that. I'm not going to read you the Sixth Amendment. Furthermore, the court held in Shepard, quote, given the pervasiveness of modern communications. By the way, this is a 1966 case. Just think about media in 1966 versus media today. Some of you can. Some of you are like, um, what? Furthermore, as the court held in Shepard, given the pervasiveness of modern communications and the difficulty of effacing uh, prejudicially, wait, preju <laughs> the difficulty of effacing prejudicial publicity from the minds of jurors, you can't just the trial courts must take strong measures to ensure that the balance is never weighed against the accused. We talked about the Shepard v. Maxwell case on a podcast a few weeks ago. Thus, the court has a duty to preserve a defendant's right to a fair trial and must limit media exposure when it is apparent that the accused might otherwise be prejudiced or just disadvantaged. To preserve the defendant's right, the court must balance the rights of the defendant and the interests of the media. In doing so, the court ought to recognize that a First Amendment claim should not impinge upon the most fundamental of all freedoms, the right to a fair trial. At some point, the media is going to go, but the First Amendment's number one, and the Sixth Amendment's number six. I don't think they're ordered in order of importance, but I realize that's an entire area of scholarship that is not my area of scholarship. Furthermore, while recognizing the importance of the media, the court has held that the Sixth Amendment does not require that a trial or any part of it be broadcast live or on tape to the public. The requirement of a public trial is satisfied by the opportunity of members of the public and the press to attend the trial and report on what they observed. That is true. Here is my problem with it. 
because this is true. A public trial is satisfied by reporters being in the courtroom. All of you that paid attention to the reporting coming out of court in Depp v. Heard, how would you feel if you had to rely on someone else's perception of a case to report on the case for you to make a determination about whether a jury decided something fairly? Because the perception, at least I can tell you, I don't have to, you know, I'm not beholden to corporate interests or anyone other than you and my team and my own ethics and values. So I can tell you how I'm feeling about something as I'm watching it and ask you if you agree or disagree or have a different take, but I'm not processing the information to give you, you know, a fair and unbiased look. I'm telling you what I'm seeing and telling you what I'm seeing. You and I might see it differently. But we've lost the media reporting that is this witness testified and said these words. That witness testified and said those words. The court ruled this. The attorneys argued that. Where is that happening? There are very few places where we're just getting this witness was called. They testified for 35 minutes. They said these things. On cross-examination, they said those things. We're not seeing that. And if that was the type of reporting, that would be different. But that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing opinion disguised as fact. And I don't even think people know they're doing it. And it's not everyone. But it's the majority that we are seeing things spun. And I need for the courts to understand that the media in 1966 and media reporting in 1966 and 1978 and media reporting now in a 24-hour news cycle are not the same medias at all. So the best way to get, hey, this is what happened, is to just watch it for yourself. We have the technology. Just let everybody watch it. Otherwise, people are going to be sitting outside this courtroom fighting to get in because now we have a fight between independent media and legacy media to cover it. And there are some in legacy media that are trying, but I don't think it's necessarily the individuals on the ground that are the problem. I think it's the loss. There is a huge loss of attention and there is a huge loss of money in large corporate media and legacy media that is driving some of these decisions. And I think individual journalists are trying to push back but most of them end up being like, fuck it, just follow me on Substack. I can't do this. And so there is this push-pull. But when the court says the only option is to filter it through someone else, I don't think that's the only option. And it's frustrating to me. The court should not permit the media to use cameras to permit unfairly prejudicial coverage. How do you know it's unfairly prejudicial? I think you're at more risk to get unfairly prejudicial coverage if you don't have cameras than if you do. Am I crazy? Have I lost my mind? If you only have people filtering it through their own experience, because again, an investigative journalist might pick up on different things a witness says than me as an attorney. Because me as an attorney has a totally different thought process about it than somebody who's writing a headline. Because what's legally relevant and what might be a good story might be different. So we're looking at the court process in two completely different ways. But if it's unfairly prejudicial, how do you even put a check on that if you don't just have the cameras? The cameras are just there. They are a neutral bystander. They're just there. And we know that they can do this without interceding in the court process because we've seen it case after case after case where you've got the cameras just pushed to the back in like covered in black and the cameras are not that big. Anyway. <clears throat> and I also don't know what is unfairly prejudicial. Covering the facts, is that unfairly prejudicial? Covering the lawyer's arguments in open court, is that unfairly prejudicial? After seeing the way the media spun and continues to spin a year later, the Depp v. Heard case and the verdict and the jurors, 
I want cameras in every fucking courtroom everywhere. Let people see for themselves. Because otherwise I don't know what you get. And we would still be fed that Depp somehow beguiled a jury and that that verdict is unfair. That's what we would still be getting fed. And we watched it ourselves and went, mm. just roll it. Court TV has been great about it. They were sensitive to minor witnesses during the Brooks case. They don't zoom in on what the attorneys have on their desks. They don't pick up conversations between attorneys and their clients, unless somebody forgets to turn off their mic, but Elaine. Um, they don't pick up things in the courtroom they're not supposed to. They don't pick up sidebars. They mute them. They've been great at it. And they've done it for decades. All right. So you see where I stand on all of this. I understand the defense attorneys are doing their job. I'm giving you the arguendo side of it. I'm I'm arguing for the transparency because, well, A, it's in my best interest because I love to do this. B, the my chair in my office, my beautiful blue chair is so much more fucking comfortable than a courtroom. I'll go sit in court. I'd rather be able to have dinner with my kids and cover it on the internet, though. <laughs> so... Both things are true. When cameras are present in the courtroom, the defendant becomes subject to a, to minute scrutiny as his or her every movement can be replayed and analyzed. That's true. That's true. As such, the court in Vallow Daybell held that video footage from a hearing displayed an inordinate focus on the defendant zooming onto her face throughout the vast majority of the hearing, regardless of who was speaking or what was happening. And that's Fair. However, in the Gwyneth Paltrow case, the court made an order that you are to keep the cameras on whoever's speaking, and they did, didn't they? And it worked just fine. We saw the attorneys at counsel table when they were arguing. We saw the person at the podium when they were arguing. The court can say, hey, if you're going to make argument, you have to come to the podium, and the cameras are just going to cover the podium, or it's just going to be the whole courtroom with the focus being on who's on the podium. And you can hear the audio from the witnesses. There were lots of ways that they dealt with it. I understand you can't just zoom in on the defendant's face the entire time. That's fair. I think there's a I think there's a balance to be had. In the present case, Mr. Koberger's actions are heavily scrutinized as self-proclaimed quote unquote experts utilize audio and video, audio and visual footage from the courtroom proceedings to make assumptions regarding his body language and character, which actualizes prior court's concerns regarding the presence of cameras in the courtroom. For instance, a YouTube video titled Psychologist Breaks Down Brian Koberger's Arraignment Body Language purports to, quote, dissect every gesture, every shift in posture, every flicker of emotion that crossed Koberger's face during this tense courtroom scene while utilizing only one courtroom video. Yeah. Like Valo Daybell, the purpose of footage is to scrutinize Mr. Koberger's actions. In Vallow Daybell, the court determined that footage during a hearing demonstrated an inordinate focus on defendant. Here, the court need not determine the purpose of a video utilizing audiovisual recordings for the purpose as the purpose of the commentator's... Per mm -hmm. This is a terrible sentence. As the purpose of the commentator's purpose is explicitly clear. Mm -hmm. And such a video would not exist except for the presence of cameras in the courtroom. Furthermore, the video posted on May 23rd has garnered over 44,000 views in two days. Further demonstrating the high level of interest in the case. Um, they don't YouTube much, do they? <laughs> not to shade anyone's, not to shade anyone's video or views. But. Okay. Additionally, an article published by the New York Post relied on audiovisual recordings to analyze Koberger's body language. The article states that by dissecting his most minute behaviors from the use of his tongue ew, to his controlled reactions and the tone of his voice can paint a picture of his mindset. The New York Post would just have somebody sitting in court to do the same thing, wouldn't they?
By doing so, the recordings are once again being utilized to scrutinize Koberger as the quote-unquote expert reached an uncorroborated conclusion after viewing only one video. Despite the, they're very mad about body language. Despite the apparent popularity of articles and videos claiming to explain body language, many such claims are not supported by scientific evidence. <sighs> They're so mad about body language. As previous articles not cited by the self-appointed body language experts and videos concerning Koberger explain, in fact, quote, studies have repeatedly shown that body language cannot accurately be, quote, read like a book. What's interesting is that the good people who do body language explain to you how they do it, explain to you why they do it, and then say things like, this is not, this is not science. This is observation. I don't know. I don't watch a ton of body language. I watch Spidey because that's my boy. I watch Observe because I like the way he does it. But there are people who do things ethically. And there are always people who do things not ethically. There are different. Okay. The internet internets differently. The internet internets differently. All right. Also, it's people's opinions, and they're allowed to make their opinions. So, again, these are opinions, and most people say these are opinions. All right. They're mad about body language. This whole, Is this whole motion going to be about body language? Great. Um, a postdoctoral fellow in psychology at McGill University explains how there is no innate universal, quote, language of the body, and when self-appointed experts associate specific gestures or facial expressions with particular meanings, the statements, quote, fall under the umbrella of pseudoscience. I mean, or opinion. Because, oh, well, you, you can't tell me a jury when they watch a video like Alec Murdoch sitting down and talking with the police aren't looking at the way that Murdoch speaks to determine the veracity of his speech. People evaluate other humans when we talk all the time. Did Rachel and Tom Sandoval really just start hooking up at Sheena's wedding in Mexico? Or was that shit going on before she got engaged to James Kennedy? Because I don't believe what they're telling me. You know? And that's what we do as humans. We look at people and evaluate them. We're humans. We evaluate faces. That's what we do. Okay. <laughs> Continuing on with this motion. They're going to be real mad. You, I've done a lot of jury trials. Like a lot of jury trials. You know what jurors look at when witnesses testify? Their face. And they look at their face and try to determine if they're telling the truth, if they're not telling the truth, if they're... if if their holistic experience of testifying seems accurate, that's how juries evaluate witnesses. Does this seem in line? Does it feel like what they're saying doesn't ring true? Does the emotion coming through in their voice not match what they're doing with their face? This is how jurors determine witnesses, but okay. I understand why they want to call it pseudoscience. And I do think there's danger saying like, I know he did X because his face did Y. I think that's not helpful. But I also think people are smart enough to be like, oh, that's interesting. All right, I'm done ranting. Let's keep reading this freaking motion. When articles and videos proclaim to reveal an individual's state of mind, they only contribute to an ecosystem of misinformation in which disparaging comments and dubious theories flourish. The internet, where disparaging comments and dubious theories flourish. And dubious food. Wait, no, that's only in Zelda. Um, I need to write that down and remember that for later. Welcome to the internet. Disparaging comments and dubious theories. <laughs> Along with making claims about Koberger based on body language, social media videos also utilize audio video audio visual footage. I'm not just going to say audio video. It says visual. I'm not going to. From courtroom proceedings to make comments regarding Koberger's character. Q Tamra judge screaming, that's my opinion. The videos use phrases, phrases such as cold iciness. Do you think Erica, Erica Jane is reading this laughing? She's like, bitch, 
Do you know how long they've called me icy? Come on. Using phrases such as cold iciness. And if you've never seen evil before, this is what is looks like when you're in presence of a demon. What? However, I will say there are a few defendants when you're in court with them and it feels different. People can observe that and talk about it. Similarly to the Irving case, the court held that clearly prejudicial statements include articles that characterize petitioner as remorseless and without conscience. Don't tell Raquel. She's going to sue the internet. Remorseless and without conscience. I think that's the same as like subhuman, demented, dementor. There were other D words. Despicable, disgusting, etc. As such, these phrases are used to characterize and make determinations about an individual based on limited footage with no regard for the presumption of innocence, which may impact a jury's opinion. Look, if the jury's come across all of this anyway, they're not going to be on your jury. But people don't all watch the internet. There's a limited group of us. Not everyone is watching this stuff. And the people that are watching it are going to watch it one way or the other. The court should not permit cameras in the courtroom to distract courtroom participants from the real purpose we are here. Well, court, they don't have to distract. Ah, delusional was also used. Yes, delusional, diabolical, demented, subhuman. Once courtroom participants know they are being recorded, they may behave differently. It's a fair concern. Aaron makes an excellent point. I think this is a very, very fair point, Aaron. You were not alone. A lot of people came into the Paltrow trial feeling exactly the way you feel and being like, oh, why didn't she just settle? And then you watch the trial and you're like, oh, you could see the shift midway through the Paltrow trial where people were like, oh, this is this is not fair. This is, this, she shouldn't be getting sued for this. You could see the shift. And the jury finding generally agreed with the way people that watched the entire trial felt. But going into the trial, people were like, this is a waste of time. Why didn't she just settle? This is ridiculous. This poor man. And then people watched the trial and their opinions changed. And that can happen here too. If there's no evidence and the government is overreaching, the people have a right to know. Especially if there's no evidence and the government is reaching, the people have a right to know. More so than in a civil case. Once courtroom participants know they're being recorded, they may behave differently. <laughs> Do you think that's Dr. Spiegel's excuse? The court in Estes held that when a case is steeped in pretrial publicity, televised jurors cannot help but feel the pressures of knowing that friends and neighbors have their eyes upon them. Jurors aren't televised anymore or shouldn't be. And that's been the way for quite a while. Jurors should not be televised. The court further elaborated on how the presence of recording equipment may not be the distraction, but more so the awareness of being recorded. The court even goes as far as to say not only will a juror's eyes be fixed on the camera, but also his mind will be preoccupied with the telecast rather than the testimony. I don't think that's true when jurors are not filmed and jurors don't get filmed anymore. This has changed. Jurors used to get filmed. The media used to put jurors' addresses in like the fucking newspaper and shit. We've come a long way in protecting jurors. This is an old and I think dated argument. Following similar reasoning, the court in Valadebel, oh, they're just going to lean into Valadebel, aren't they? They're going to be like, Your Honor, they did it here. They can do it again. It's fine. Mm hmm. The court in Valadebel expressed concern regarding the additional pressure witnesses and counsel may be exposed to knowing their every expression, utterance, and appearance will be captured and circulated without their control. Fair. The court also notes that the pressure placed on witnesses may unduly influence jurors as they make an incorrect determination regarding the witness while he or she is under the additional pressure of being recorded. 
The presence of cameras also places additional responsibilities on the trial judge. Now, not only must the judge preside over the proceedings, a task which requires his utmost attention, that's true. Being a judge requires a type of focus that I don't think I have. But also the media to ensure it complies with the rules governing courtroom conduct. You can have others do that, though. Like your bailiff, et cetera, et cetera. Other people can be in charge of that. Either way. As such, the existence of cameras in the courtroom may potentially burden a judge. Your Honor, it's okay. It's okay to say no. The existence of cameras in the courtroom may potentially burden a judge as he might have his attention diverted from the task at hand, the fair trial of the accused. Judge A seemed to handle it just fine. Additionally, the defendant, so did Judge Newman. Um, I'm forgetting the judge with the great hair from Brooks. Additionally, the defendant may also be distracted by the cameras. The inevitable close-ups of his gestures and expressions during the ordeal of his trial might well transgress his personal sensibilities, his dignity, his ability to concentrate on the proceedings before him. Sometimes the difference between life and death, dispassionately, freely, and without distraction from wide public surveillance. Judge Darrow, thank you, chat. As a result, the defendant may not be able to fully focus on the proceedings despite being entitled to having his or her day in court. Therefore, the presence of cameras allows for the potential that a courtroom will devolve from a place for the victim society and the accused to receive justice to a mere spectacle. Society is part of that, though. And in a modern society, there's room. Conclusion, the courtroom has a duty to preserve the defendant's right to a fair trial. Yes, and I think there's a balance. Um, all right, let's go to Court TV real quick because they are premiering this. But the conclusion is the court should exclude cameras from future courtroom proceedings to protect the integrity of the process. Finally, we are getting to today's video. Um, oh, good. It hasn't started yet. So we're going to go take a look at this video as it premieres, and we are going to watch together the hearing from this morning. I'm going to, oh, I can't pause this because it's a premiere. Oh, yes, I can. Um, I'm going to pause this real quick. No, I didn't do that. Here's the hearing that we're going to watch together. I'm going to swoop in just a second. Nope. Nope, there's nothing I can do. All right, I'm going to swoop in just a second. This is the first gag order hearing dealing with the Gonsalves family and what they can say and what their attorney can say. That's different than the afternoon hearing that is still underway. All right? Can we just play Pope Burnham's Welcome to the Internet? Yeah, we should just mail them the lyrics. All right. So let us dive into this together and watch... What happens? Hold on. Let me do this. There, that's better. Um, all right. I do not like the music they chose for their premiere. It's my personal preference. <laughs> I haven't gotten to watch um, Real Housewives of Orange County yet. Depending on the layout of the courtroom, I will make myself bigger or smaller as needed. And yeah, I hate this particular audio. Let's see. Um, we're a little behind. So there we go. Can you all hear? First thing, yes, Brian Koberger is in a suit. He is allowed to choose whether he wants to be in a suit or not. This already seems low, so I'm going to do this. He's allowed to choose if he wants to be in a suit or not for courtroom proceedings. His lawyers are allowed to give him that option. He might have chosen to be in a suit. He might not. I will keep an eye on where I'm at on the screen and move it if needed. Oh, I think that works out perfectly. You let me know, chat. Do we like it? Do we look good? Do I look okay? Are we good? It is quiet, but nobody's talking at the moment. The judge is not on the bench yet. And, let me, oh. <laughs> it helps if I turn the volume all the way up. <laughs> me. All right, the court is not in yet. So the court is going to be coming in. But this is the kind of thing the defense was just talking about. A zoom in on the defendant when court's not in session. That court, that judge is right there in the corner, isn't he? All right. I will turn this up more if we need to. So 
welcome to court. It's a lot of waiting. It's a lot of waiting. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Weird placement for me, I know. But if I go up here, I mean, maybe that, maybe that's better. I'm glad Court TV has this. Um, no one puts Judge Judge in the corner. Judge Judge is definitely in the corner. I'm so in love with my lip glosses. I'm so glad. The no zoom ins can be for, yeah, it can be. It can be a focus on who's talking. That's easy to do. I'm glad to see we still haven't gotten the zoom issues worked out. That's delightful for everyone involved. Judge Judge is like, fuck this shit. <laughs> I'm going to zoom, zoom this a little. All right. This hybrid uh, approach is counting. They're trying to figure out. Okay, so uh, let's get on the record, please. Okay. Now we're going on the record. We are now on the record. This is uh, State versus Brian Koberger, CR 2922805. Uh, we're here. This background noise sucks. Hearing. Uh, this was from 1030 this morning, the Mountain Time. You will notice I always have a notepad while I'm doing these. Because, uh, the media sought some relief from the items. The media one's going on now. Uh, there was a delay to find out what the Supreme Court was going to determine. They did it. And uh, this morning we have uh, the state represented by Mr. Thompson and Mr. Rudley. Mr. Koberger is in the, in the uh, courtroom, represented by Ms. Taylor and Mr. Logston. And uh, I believe the uh, Mr. Gray is here. There he is. Let me sit back here, Your Honor. And I believe uh, some of the family is participating, observing on Zoom. So uh, before we get into the arguments, um, I want to address the Gonzalez uh, family. So present in court right now are the prosecution sitting at this table here, the defendant and his attorney, which as they shift court, I might just stay down here, the defendant and his attorney. And then you have um, the judge, the Gonzalez family attorney is in court because this is their motion. But the other parties are part of this motion, too. This is from this morning. There is a current hearing going on now. The background noise is tough. So the judge is not on Zoom, but there is also a Zoom. So you can see the judge in the back corner, but there is also a Zoom for uh, victims, families, etc. I might call into these on Zoom as media to watch the proceedings in the future and then come on later and cover them depending on what the judge does here. So the judge is on Zoom. I don't know if the Gonzalez family is on Zoom. Andrea Burkhart's in court today, yes, and lives locally, which is delightful to have her there covering it. I really like the way she breaks things down. Um, and all the families, really, didn't really have an opportunity to do this at the arraignment. Uh, my heart does go out to the families. Um, and um, the loss to your children is devastating and horrific. I mean, there's no dispute about that. I also want to um, acknowledge and apologize because at the arraignment, I did stumble over a couple of the names, Bailey's name and Raymond's name. And I want to explain that. I was uh, up all night. Um, really ill, probably food poisoning, and I was not at full potential. Uh, probably also some emotion and nerves as I read those names. And uh, the judge just said I had uh, food poisoning and is apologizing for mispronouncing names. Also talked about nerves. I think that's fair. There is no closed captioning on the video. I apologize. 
I'm sorry. So that's my apology for that. I know some people were concerned about that. Oh, the judge has been paying attention to the, to the media. I also then. wanted to explain uh, a procedure um, at the arraignment that... Oh, the judge is straight answering the media. ...drawn from the media that, uh, that some people were... Con con the judge is just straight up answering the media right now. Interesting. Confused uh, when Mr. Koberger declined to enter a plea. And I, I just wanted to clear that up because I didn't really see any explanation about that in the media. I talked about it. That is Mr. Koberger. It's a procedure. Right. I know and, the answer. Uh, under Rule 11A1 of the Idaho Criminal Rules, this is a quote. If a defendant refuses to plead, the court must direct the entry of a plea. We talked about that. Guilty. That is not unusual. But reading the media, it seems like somewhat mysterious. So, Sir, you're reading the wrong media. That, what are you reading? Uh, particularly to the media. Sir, the headlines are to drive attention. So. Yes, they're going to make it a bigger deal than it is. Are you confused by how media works? Yeah. All right, answer it's the media. A issue. Go ahead. Um, but it's somewhat, uh, well, I, I, I think that I have an obligation just as the media has an obligation to. You don't have an obligation to answer it. If there wasn't a fucking uh, gag order that was so broad, then you know who could answer that question? Any of the lawyers involved in this case, including Brian Koberger's defense attorney. Brian Koberger's defense attorney could just say, hey, this is a very normal procedure. He has this right. He exercised this right. That's all. That, but, but. Uh, processes that, uh, that uh, we are responsible to follow in the courtroom. And. Um, I explained. And that's important Important for journalists. That's also important for, uh, for the citizens. So this deputy looks like he's ready to grab that jury box and jump out of his chair. Look, he's like, he's ready to, to go. Supreme Court website. And it's very, very easy to read that and maybe get a better understanding. All right. So that's my speech for today. Um, Mr. Gray, come on up. And if you allow me just a minute or two to get yeah. started out here. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Gray. He is, and that's, I mean, he's just grouping the things that he looks at. Deputy has chilled a little bit. Proceed, Your Honor. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, first, Your Honor, we'd like to um, thank you for apologizing to the victim's family. Um, I think it was an emotional day for them, and uh, they appreciate your apology. I know that they took that part up. Thank you. Uh, I first want to start with the procedural history of this non-dissemination order, if I could. On January 3rd, 2000. This is the attorney for the Gonsalves family arguing his motion. If you're like, hey, I've heard this before, it's because we've covered these written motions like four different times. So the written motions were written before this went to the Supreme Court of Idaho and after. So we've covered these arguments a lot. So you're going to hear a lot of the same arguments. This is him again talking to the court and saying this is why this gag order should be removed or modified. And yes, it does seem that he's wearing tennis shoes. I don't judge. Look, when I was pregnant in court and and then again after my back surgery, shoes weren't, I could not do dress shoes at all. So I was in comfier shoes, but I always let the court know. And we had a couple of other attorneys who had like knee issues and foot issues. So I'm just, you know, I don't, okay. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't judge. I always assume there's a reason. 23, the Judge Marshall ordered, uh, submitted a non-dissemination order. And in that order, it applied to parties uh, in the action, which would have been the prosecution, the defense, and any agents, investigators involved in it. After that non-dissemination order was issued, I reached out to uh, 
the prosecutor's office and see if I could get Judge Marshall's email. For some reason, I don't know if they took it down, but I couldn't find it online. Um, and they informed me that they were not privy to give me that information. <clears throat> um, then on January 13th, um, there was a Zoom call that was requested by Judge Marshall. That Zoom call. We've heard was much. At one o'clock. Much about that Zoom uh, call happened to I received an email at 12.58 from Judge Marshall's clerk requesting a Zoom call to speak to all interested parties. Uh, the Zoom call occurred at 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. During that meeting, the judge reminded us, all the parties involved, uh, it was the prosecution, it was the defense, it was myself, it was the attorneys for the victims, families, uh, the attorneys for the witnesses, I believe were there as well, a number of attorneys, uh, and reminded us that her non-dissemination order uh, mirrored that of Idaho Rules of Professional Conduct 3.6. Um, as part of that hearing, and I think it's details here, she talks about the rule applies to all lawyers participating in the Zoom meeting. Yes. The she state did. and the defense and all attorneys for the witnesses. When she had that Zoom meeting, and I've requested the transcript from that Zoom meeting and haven't been able to receive it yet. Well, there uh, was a memo. Court, uh, so we could have a full transcript of what went on that day. I don't know if they have one. I don't know if it was recorded. But as part of that meeting, I had questioned uh, Judge Marshall regarding the victim's family and whether or not they were allowed to speak to the media based on the fact that she had said all interested parties as well. In the, in the the initial non dissemination order, um, I didn't receive any clarification. I was just instructed to go back to Idaho Rules of Professional Conduct 3.6, as well as uh, I was. I don't know told, if that's out of line though. This is in quotes from her Zoom release: "Take their duties in that most regard." And conducting themselves and advising their clients. Y'all, I'm grabbing your questions for when we take a break I take after that this. As I should tell my clients to be quiet. Um, she reiterated that again in the Zoom call by saying that my I had ethical duties striped above and the, and the uh, I have rules of professional conduct uh, for commentary of Rule 3.6. And she reminded me later that lawyers have a responsibility in giving advice to their clients. Um, I disagreed with Judge Marshall on almost every point during that meeting. Um, as well as, if I had known that we were going to be discussing the Idaho Rules of Professional Conduct in, those, uh, in that issue, I would, would have prepared. But That's fair. Only having a three hour notice uh, to allow me, and not knowing what the subject of the meeting was going to be. That's fair. Didn't allow me to address those issues at that time. Now, after the non dissemination order in January 3rd, and then the January 13th, 2023 uh, meeting, the judge amended the non-dissemination order uh, on January 18th. And she basically repeated the same order, except for, she added, she, the attorneys for she any interested party. Yep, in she made states, it way broader. Including attorneys representing witnesses, victims, or victims' families, as well as parties to the above entitled action. So you can see the difference is that the first one dealt with parties to the case. The second one went way over the top, addressing all attorneys that might be associated with the case or any attorneys that might have an interested party in this case. And so that that's covers where we are today. Victims. I filed a motion based on that additional language. Too much. Now, I'd like to get into some of the issues here. It's very clear that I am not a party to the case and the victim's families are not a party to the case. But they are interested. That's very clear through all the case law, as well as... Can I, can I interrupt you? Yes. There's, there's no dispute about that. Okay. Then I, you're not, you're not, uh, your, your clients are not parties. The, the judge is like, correct. The parties of this case are the state and Mr. Koberger. Correct. That's that's okay. and so, that's that's clear that's clear in the in the case law uh, with regard to any victims or victims' families. There are constitutional protections and statutory protections for Parties. victims and their families. I would agree. That's that's well established. 
So let's get into the actual non-dissemination order itself, how it addresses to me personally as the attorney for the victim's family. Um, this non-dissemination order, of all of the cases and all of the motions that were filed, the background white noises and referencing wrong. every case that was listed in this case, none of them apply to a victim's attorney, an attorney representing the victims. The Idaho v. Trap Tap case was an attorney uh, speaking about a judge who he was in front of. The Good case was a defense attorney that spoke to the media. The Mezeroff case was a defense attorney and a prosecutor. The Morrissey case was a defense attorney and a press conference. Barner v. Delahunty was an attorney and a judge, all parties to the case. Cutler was a defense attorney, U.S. v. Cutler. Zao v. Slot was a defense attorney. Erwin v. Dow were the prosecutor's actions and speaking to the media. Shepard v. Marshall, Maxwell, is a trial publicity regarding the prosecutor's actions prior to trial. None of those things apply to the victim's family or the victim's attorney in any way. Now, I do agree that the court has the power to control those that are parties to the case and that are involved in the case in some way. But we have to define that, what means involvement in the case. Part of that is that the judge referred to the Idaho Rules of Professional Conduct 3.6, probability. That's true. She references that multiple times as the basis for her non-dissemination order in this case and how it might apply to me. If you'll read the first paragraph, a lawyer who participates or has participated in the investigation or litigation of a matter shall not make extrajudicial statements. That is not me. It never has been me. It can't be me because I'm not involved in the litigation. She also says can I, that... Can I, can I ask you a question about <clears throat> that? Because, I mean, I think the case law uh, is, is quite clear that uh, attorneys who are representing witnesses can be uh, can be restricted to some degree, partly uh, because they have access to particular information that may not should not be shared with the public. Um, and if I'm recalling correctly, um, the state has suggested or has determined that your, your information was shared with you are witnesses potentially. How? So that's no, that's how? that's kind of the how. No. How? Go ahead. As part of that is that let's just make it clear: the victim's family. They're only witnesses if this goes to a death penalty phase, and even then, they're not percipient witnesses. How are they witnesses? This is the family. No. Has never been involved in this investigation ever from the get-go. When after Mr. Kohlberger was indicted, we received no information about anything regarding the prosecution. Nothing. They wouldn't even tell us that a grand jury was being impaneled for Mr. Kohlberger. They told us that there was a grand jury that was being impaneled. And common sense, we figured it out, because he's the only guy in the, in the county. But they wouldn't even relay that information. They haven't really, really given us any information regarding the investigation of the case. But the most critical part of it is that the prosecution has never, ever interviewed the Gonzalez family. So how in the world would we ever be able to be witnesses in this case? And for what purpose would we be? If you're asking about for sentencing spaces, purposes, that's post-conviction. That's after he's been convicted on the case. Prior to trial, we're not any witnesses. And that falls into completely different statutes. That falls into the restitution statute. It falls into the victim statute. I just handled that matter in front of the Lori Vallow case, where the judge, I had a motion, the defense did not want the victim's pain, family to appear. And so the judge had to make a determination whether they were immediate family. That's different. Because it was the grandparents. Completely different statutes because that was post-conviction. And that witnesses, those witnesses were allowed in the courtroom and were involved in the sentencing aspect of it. Okay? So we are in a very, very different factual situation here. I'm not asking as a witness to the case, which witness to the case, I, they never ever told us in any way how we would be witnesses in this case, other than the conjecture that we may have potentially. That's not good enough to stop the free speech of the victim's family as well. 
Visa. Here's my takeaway so far. We're going to get back to it. Um, these, this particular victim family is not thrilled with the prosecution at all in this case. Not thrilled with the prosecution at all in this case. And I imagine this is going to get a little feistier. Um, we're going to talk about the tension between the role of the prosecution, victims' families, victim attorneys, and the defense after this hearing. Don't let me forget because there is a there is a tension or there can be a tension there. And that is hard because the prosecution does not represent the victims. The prosecution represents the wing of the state that is tasked with prosecuting people. So they represent the people of the state of Idaho. They do not specifically represent what the victims want. They are supposed to take it into consideration, but the prosecution can choose to do things whether the victim's family wants to do them or not. And so the push pull between the rights of the victim, the rights of the defendant and the power of the state is a push pull. And there are definitely times where victims are pissed at the prosecution. It is, it is not uncommon. So this push pull is the attorney saying, your honor, we can't even talk about it. The judge saying, well, they said you might be a witness. And he's like, how are we a witness? They aren't even communicating with us and they're not percipient witnesses. If they were witnesses, it would only be to the penalty phase and that's post conviction. So that's, that's why you're starting to see the sass here. And I hope that that helps understand. So this lawyer represents the victim's family and he is frustrated with the prosecution, the court and the defense, it seems from what's being argued right now, if that makes sense. So let's continue on. And I see some questions coming in. I'm going to keep grabbing them as we listen. And I'll I'll do a Q&A at the end of this hearing before we look at the other motions while the other hearing is concluding. The other hearing has live witnesses, so that hearing is not concluded yet. That's still ongoing. <clears throat> and we won't get the video of it until for fuck ever after it's done. Well, it's myself. The other thing is that if the victims can say whatever they want, you know, the free speech, and that's exempt, why would I not be allowed to say the same thing that they're, they say? My understanding is that uh, this your is the court. are not restricted in any way, never have to. Well, I'll give you an example. I think is that true? Yeah, that's right. That? Well, I agree now, because that's not the tone of the Zoom meeting. Well, we're not talking about the okay. tone. I'm talking about the language He's of the He's talking about the law, yes. sir. The language of the order now, because any interested parties, I ask for clarification, <laughs> now I understand that they can say whatever they want. And that's correct. But here's the problem. If they said... We think the judge is crazy. Would I advise them against that? Absolutely. Thank you. But if I went and said, <laughs> my victim, my fa the family asked, uh, has said that they think the judge is crazy. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm repeating exactly what they said. <coughs> now, what comes into play is, for our purposes today, is what if I offer up my own opinion? Right? Well, then I, there's, I'm already governed by the Idaho rules of professional conduct. And if I, I'm glad you're acknowledging that. That's yeah. different. Well, every, every attorney is, Your Honor. I mean, it's like you. Every attorney is. So, <laughs> so I'm not, but every rule doesn't apply all the time. If I'm talking poorly about a judge, another rule might pop in. 8.3, I think, is what it is. Or 8.1. If I'm saying other things that might affect things another way, then maybe the probabilistic. But the probabilistic, I don't even think, applies to me in this anyway. Because... If you look at it, it says it applies to a lawyer who is participating or has participated in the investigation or litigation of a matter, shall not make extrajudicial statements. And it goes on, highlighted by Judge Marshall, then in paragraph three. <coughs> the, the rule says for the basic general prohibition about lawyers making statements that a lawyer knows or should know will have a substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing the adjudicated proceeding. And at the bottom of the paragraph, it says this. Rule only applies to lawyers who are or who have been involved in the investigation or litigation of cases and their associates. If I'm not a party to the case, 
I can't be involved in the investigation or the litigation of this case in any way. So I would argue that the trial publicity rule of professional conduct does not apply to me as well. Help me understand fair. what you That's fair. think you can't say that you've already been saying. I, I have no idea. I have no you, idea what you, You've been on the media and you've, you've uh, had interviews. Uh, so I'm kind of wondering <laughs> what, what, how do you feel that you're... <laughs> This is a hearing, for those of you just coming in, this is a hearing over the gag order. This is the cons this is the Gonsalves family attorney, Mr. Gray. The judge is saying, how are you precluded from anything? I've seen you on the media. Like you're out, you're out here talking. So how are you really restricted? So Judge Judge is like, um, I need, I'm going to need you to explain because I don't think you're as restricted as you think you are, which is interesting. We'll see how this continues to go. You've been uh, res restrained in any way uh, with this order. I think you're not seeing the, <laughs> what, what the point is. What the point is, is that I the, court has <laughs> is, the court has issued a non-dissemination order that restricts... Per I think you're not seeing what the point is. Oh, shit. Look, I'd get mad if my kids said that to me. Um, you don't say that to a judge in court. I think you're missing the point. That's that's not going to go well. First Amendment rights that is overly broad and almost every aspect of it. Anybody that's interested and they have an attorney. When an attorney who's walking down the street could offer up his opinion, in any way. It also takes I'm away an attorney, from the I have opinions. Doesn't the court want victims, families, to have representation, to guide them through the legal process? That's not the point of this Don't motion, they, though, man. Don't they encourage that? That Sir? they can explain things, to maybe advise them on what to say, what not to say? Sir? I mean, I, if you're taking my voice away, you're taking the voice away of everything. The other part of it is this, is that I'm absolutely blown away that the prosecution doesn't agree with me in this case. Ooh. The reason being is that we, they are representing the victims. No. Which in turn are the victims' families. No, they're not. They represent the people of the state of Idaho, sir. They consult with the victims. They are there to seek justice for the deceased victims, but they do not represent the victims. That is not the role of the prosecution. That's why you have a job as a victim's advocate. And it's why victims need advocacy. It is a difficult push-pull of the system. But no, they don't represent the victims. They don't. They don't. Sir. Also, this is peaking. Hold on, let me turn this down. I'm going to try to moderate this sound a little bit. because. And I have not seen a poor a little line of communication in my 22 years of practicing. Oh, fuck. Than the prosecution's office and the Gonzalez family. And I think it, it, it stems from, initially, we were you? critical of the investigation. They, were, they wanted to find the person who did this. That's normal emotions. And then from that point on, it has been, we are the end. And that's how we feel in this. And so me guiding them and then trying to limit my voice and helping them out in some way okay. and then throwing out a random idea that they may be potential witnesses when they never ever interviewed them in any way, it's just an attempt to shut the attorney out and shut the family out is what it is. Because if I had come to you today and said, we he is accusing the prosecution of trying to silence the victim's families and their victim's rights attorneys, and that's not going to go well. He said, I have not seen a poor line of communication in 20 years, and he thinks it's because they were critical of the investigation. I think it's because they there was a concern We'll go back to that Zoom call memo. There was a concern that this attorney was taking information from the victim's families provided by prosecution and law enforcement and leaking it to the media. 
That was the concern. Oh, shit. We have seven interviews, Your Honor. We may be witnesses in this case. We've done all of these things. It may be a different story. We haven't done anything. They haven't interviewed the entire family. So, well, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what's in all the investigation. Obviously, uh, and a lot of us don't know, and probably won't know well, until the trial. The other okay. thing. Well, let me just say this. I think one of one of the potential issues is. Uh, this is potentially a death penalty case. Hasn't been noticed, but it, that is uh, a That's potential. That's a potential. Uh, and uh, the families of the victims certainly would be witnesses in that process. But that's post-conviction. Uh, but that's post-conviction. That is post not post-conviction, technically. It, it? It's, it's it, the... It. Well, it, Here's the argument. I love this legal argument. The judge is saying that a death penalty phase of a trial, which is if this is a death penalty case and they have time still to notice it, they are not at the end of their time to notice it, meaning the prosecution can still seek the death penalty or not. They are still within their time period to say it. If they notice the death penalty, there are two phases of the trial. The guilt phase, where a jury determines if Koberger is the one who committed these murders. And then after the guilt phase, there is a penalty phase. And the penalty phase determines whether it is life or death. The reason I keep saying, and this attorney keeps saying that's post-conviction, is because if you don't get to the guilt phase, you never, if the person's not guilty, you don't get to the punishment or the penalty phase of a trial. And the court is saying it's technically not post-conviction because until the entire trial is done and they've determined life and or death, it is not completely post-conviction. However, it's post-guilt. There's already a guilty verdict at that point. So all of the rights for appeal and everything would attach at that point. So I agree that it's post-conviction. Y'all let me know what you think. If your goal is fair and impartial jury, right, that's the reason for the non-dissemination order. Well, after the conviction, that goes away. Well, it's also confidence in the in the uh, in the process. Uh, so I have that. If you want confidence I, in the process, put cameras in the courtroom so we can see it happen. I have I have a job of protecting and preserving the First Amendment and also the Sixth Amendment. And there is some balancing there. That is why uh, lawyers who have access to information that is not accessible by the public uh, have particular restrictions. That's what this that's what this whole case is, is about. I mean, this hearing is about. And as an officer of the court, I can tell you we have zero access. Okay, so you're not you're saying that you're that the prosecutor's office has not shared information Anything. with interesting regarding the facts of this case no they have huh all right how, how things occurred there, everybody's going to have a chance to weigh in on this and I, oh the I prosecutor just, must have made a face did you see the judge the judge looked over at the prosecutor's table i love watching court so much the judge looked over at the prosecutor's table and then started talking everyone's going to have a chance the prosecutor must have made a face because the judge is reacting to the prosecutor's face at the moment Huh. You're helping me understand what the issues are, so thank you. Well, is so that's really the issue here. I mean, and, and it's, this is an important ruling because what you're doing is to you, it's is, an important ruling. This has never happened before, ever has it happened before that a judge, Judge Marshall, has tried to silence the attorneys for victims. I don't. I think that's a never broad statement, sir. That I'm aware of. Would you would you feel more comfortable if uh, there was a more Big concrete description yes, of he would. what people could say and what yes, they can't say? Yes, he would. I don't think you have the authority to. Well, I think oh. I do. I, I, well, my argument is is that part of the argument is that I have to back up. I don't think you have the authority to, sir. His attorney came in fucking hot. Like he's told the judge. He's told the judge, I don't think you understand what's going on here. And then told the judge, I don't think you have the authority here. <gasps> oh my. Oh, oh my. Okay. Anyone who is in law school looking at this, 
you reserve your honor. I don't think you have the authority to do that to like when the bailiff is putting you, the attorney in handcuffs or the rights of your client, the constitutional rights of your client are being absolutely trampled. And even then, these are words to leverage very, very lightly. This is bringing way too much heat for this judge way, way, way too early in these proceedings. And I'm wondering if some of this is performing for the client or the cameras. That's just a question because this is a lot of smoke for this judge. And it's not a, your honor, let's work together to find something that works. It's a, you don't have the authority to silence me. All right, sir, then go out and say whatever the fuck you want and see if the judge does anything about it. If you want to fight and drag him into the ring and fight, you're going to lose. He's the judge. Oh, oh boy. Oh boy. Comfortable if uh, there was a more concrete description of what people could say and what they can't say. I don't think you have the authority to, Your Honor. Well, I think I do have the authority. I, I, well, my argument is, is that part of the argument is that... In fact, I know I have the authority to do that. Well, and the authority would be through your fair, the attempt to have a fair and impartial jury, that you can control uh, people that are involved in the case, correct? That's part of it. And we're not involved in the case. Okay, that's, so, that is, that's hard to accept. But we're not witnesses in the case. We're not involved in the investigation. We're not involved in the litigation. I can't file any motions. I can't subpoena anybody. I can't cross-examine witnesses. I can't do anything. So this idea that there's this loose idea that there may be weighing that versus our freedom to speak, the First Amendment, is... We're talking about your that's right. speech. That's right. Not your client's speech. But that is that's speech. speech. That is part of it, though. Well, in your in your memorandum, you 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 are suggesting that you also have an independent position that you are representing yourself. I do. It's distinct and distinctive from your responsibility to your clients. That's why the motion. Y'all, one of the one of the critical things of practicing law in a courtroom is being able to read people, read people's faces. Do you see how delighted this judge is? This judge, he said, I don't think you have the authority. And this judge went, oh, yes, let's. Um, he, he interrupted again to say, I know I have the authority. And the fast paced back and forth where these two are courtroom sparring is not how every judge likes to do things. But this judge is clearly tickled by getting to have this interaction. You can see the smile. Judge Judge is like, continue to tell me more how I don't have authority, which I very much like seeing from a judge. Not every judge is like this. Some judges are very much like you talk and then you wait. This judge is jumping right in and is like, let us go. And I enjoy it. I enjoy um, I enjoy the way this judge is engaging in this because he's already not thrilled. If the judge was already on the side of this attorney, he would say, yes, counsel, I understand. What is your next point? The judge is not on the side of this attorney at the moment, and the attorney knows it or or should know it. And you can all watch as this judge is like, <laughs> let us let us do that more. It's great. It's great. It's for amending or clarification because there's the clients that have the free to speak. There's me repeating what they have to say. They said the judge, we thought the judge was crazy, and I said the judge was crazy. I can't be, it doesn't violate the non discrimination order because I'm allowed to say that. And then there's my independent voice where I said, the judge is crazy. Yeah, I think the judge is crazy. That goes into another way, right? Where it would be, I would be, Idaho Rules of Professional Conduct would fall into play and what I would be doing or what I couldn't do. Not the non dissemination order because we're not parties to the case. I'd be governed by the Idaho Rules of Professional Conduct if I made those statements, extradite those statements. And I might, may or may not fall under the probability. I would argue that I don't because I'm not a party to it. I'm not litigated it. I don't have any, any, any information on it. None of those things. So really, that's where the authority for me, for my voice, would come from the Idaho Rules of Professional Conduct if I did that. And if I made a statement, 
that I thought didn't apply for trial publicity purposes, that would be an argument for another day. But it wouldn't be for you, for a contentious court for me, because I'm not a party to the case and I'm not involved in the case in any way. I'm just repeating what my clients say or I'm just saying my own individual But here you opinion, are. Which doesn't, by the way, makes it absolutely unduly prejudicial. Because what if a guy is on an uh, Idaho bar member, is walking down the street, looks up, sees a television uh, program where the Gonzalez family says, well, we thought the judge was crazy, right? And then all of a sudden, Stop the media using that example. Outside, I interview him, they say, hey, you're an attorney here. What about the judge being crazy? Well, I've been in front of him three or four times, and I, did, I, I would agree with him. You're going to sanction him and contempt of court? You can't. Same as me, because I'm not a party to it. He's not a party to it. He might be governed by the Idaho Rules of Professional Conduct by I'm not commenting on you, Your Honor. But it wouldn't be because of the judge's non-dissemination. We're also going to comment on you. So how can it not apply to him, we, we but it can apply you. to me? It can't. Well, the, the case law suggests that uh, because you represent potential witnesses that you have access to information that may not uh, or should not be shared. And he with does not agree that's, with that's, that position. That's what the case law says. And, that, and he I doesn't agree with that. What, what potential witnesses are we, number one? And what access to information do we have? Yeah, he doesn't uh, I think agree. the defense has argued that we have some sort of access because I have, the clients can tell me whatever they want to tell me, right? Well, that's free speech. They can say whatever they want to me, and I can go off and say whatever I want that they said. Because it's free speech. It's the First Amendment. So you can't, I mean, this non-dissemination order is so broad, none of the case law applies to people that are outside of the defense or the prosecution. That's the point of it. That's the whole point of a non-dissemination order, because they have access to it. They have access to the information. Victims, attorneys, families do not. Well, I mean, I, we may or may not be a potential sometimes witness. They do. Is enough for your honor? I just can't see that, especially when there's no history of them ever being a witness. And to tell you the truth, the day after they filed that notice, tell me or the, the day truth. before they filed the notice that we may be potential witnesses, we had just gotten out of a meeting with the prosecutor's office discussing whatever we could discuss, like our concerns. So you have some access because you have access to meetings with the prosecutors. And this is exactly the judge's point. Do you see the look on the bailiff's face? Here's the thing. Bailiffs generally work in one courtroom for quite a long period of time. So a, a, a court will generally have a bailiff with a particular judge for years. So this bailiff knows exactly what this judge is thinking of this attorney right now and is looking at him like, really? I'm living for the faces of the bailiff. That's giving the bailiff will always the bailiff and the clerk will always give you kind of a beat on what's going on in the court. And then the court reporter is next. The court reporter is a great judge of witnesses. If you have a good relationship with the court reporter, you can find out a lot about what your jury might be thinking about your witnesses. All right. The bailiff's face that was like, sir, you might be in danger. And I'm, I'm not here for it. That's all we do is go in and talk about our concerns, and they tell us we can't say anything. We can't say anything. We can't say anything. We'll get to it. When we walk up, not aware in that meeting what we described as being witnesses in this case. But all of a sudden, the next day, they thought we might be, even though they've never interviewed us. So they're throwing stuff it's in the air. Really an they think it's not justified, and the idea that he thinks maybe might. Is not enough to regulate my free speech in this as the attorney for the victim's family, because that's what we are. We're not attorney for witnesses, we're attorney for the victim's family. And if the court has any other questions, okay. I'd be more than happy. Sir? I understand your position. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Green. So oh, let me go to the state. I don't know if that's Mr. Thompson or Mr. Rutter. Oh, yeah, let's see uh, what the state has to say. Certainly. Thank you. I'm very interested in what the state has to say on this. 
Uh, if I may. Oh, he's uh, not going to be this, happy. This, Mr. Rudley is actually um, going to be arguing on the motion himself. But, but as attorneys, we have a duty of candor to the court. Mr. Gray has made representations <laughs> to the court that at best are misleading. <laughs> and in a many ways, simply untrue. I need to correct them for the record. The is Your Honor, counsel has a duty of candor to the court, and my learned friend has made misrepresentations to the court. Is not a good foot to get off on with the lead prosecutor in the case. This prosecutor is not happy at all with the representations made by Mr. Gray. And we saw this in the Zoom call. This has been contentious from the beginning, but we owe a duty of candor is a bless your heart statement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here, I do not want the public to come away with the impression that improprieties Look occurred there. first. Naughty list. Mr. Gray, on behalf of his clients, has propounded a number of questions to our office and investigators. We have answered the ones that we can. We have not shared ones that we are concerned that Mr. Gray or his clients would make public and compromise the integrity of the investigation. That's fair. And to say that we provided more information is simply not true. Secondly, claims that law enforcement has not interviewed his clients and that somehow that is the investigator's fault. In fact, from the very beginning, the investigators have attempted to interview his clients and Mr. Gray has not permitted it. So just for the record, I want to make sure that's clear. What? No, 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 no. So you're, so you're telling me that Mr. Gray just represented to the court that his clients, the Gonsalves family, are not witnesses because they've never been interviewed. And he argued that over and over and over again. And the prosecution is like, however, they haven't been interviewed because he will not allow them to be interviewed. That is coloring an argument to the court that is not exactly accurate because they've never been interviewed and I've not allowed them to be interviewed are two very different things when you are standing before the court in the court of law. The judge is not going to like that at all. And I, I'm not surprised that the prosecutor stood up to set the record straight in front of the judge. That's a shady argument. Thank you. If I can speak to that, Your Honor. You'll be able to Thank come you. back in after you hear the other arguments. Thank you. Mr. Rudd, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. In State v. Spencer, the Idaho Supreme Court noted that it is also the duty of the prosecutor to ensure the right to a fair and impartial trial. Under the dictates of Shepard v. Maxwell, the court has a duty to take affirmative steps to address the impacts that um, intense pretrial publicity can have on the case. As noted in Shepard, Nebraska Press Association v. Stewart, and their progeny, an order like the one in this case is an appropriate measure for addressing that duty of the court. As uh, Mr. Boston's experts have noted, attorneys often have information about a case that may not be appropriate for dissemination in the press. Additionally, uh, attorneys carry a greater uh, weight when dealing uh, appearing on television. We For do? Instance, what might be easier. Wait. We do. Attorneys carry a greater weight when appearing on television. We do. Do we? Is that true? What case law says that? I'm going to send it to my mother and be like, Mom, see? Very fancy. I have questions. For the parties to address is a juror that says, 
I've seen coverage on the case, but I don't always trust what I've seen on TV, and I can set that aside. What's more difficult is a juror that says, I've seen attorneys for the prosecution, attorneys for the defense, or attorneys for the victims on uh, television talking about a critical aspect of the case. In um, the matter of Gentile versus State Bar of Nevada, that case involved an attorney uh, who held one press conference in 1991 after the indictment of his client. This case, uh, in this case, Mr. Grace repeatedly received statements and been on television. At minimum, it's insincere to argue that he's feeling bound by the order when it's clearly not abided by. In Gentile, the court noted that the speech of attorneys is subject to less uh, substantial, or it can be regulated uh, by less substantial means. In this case, as we've shown by the affidavit we filed, the Gonzalez families are potential witnesses in a trial, or more specifically, at sentencing. The order in this case is not vague, overbroad, unduly restrictive, or not narrowly drawn. It precludes all extrajudicial statements of the attorneys in this case. Sir, it's a bit broad. Attorneys for the uh, witnesses, victims, law enforcement, uh, and investigators. The order addresses uh, if the court were to apply strict scrutiny, the order addresses a substantial likelihood uh, that pretrial publicity poses to the um, integrity of the judicial system and is uh, tailored to ensure that the rights to a fair trial are upheld. As um, we briefed in the case of Levine, the alternatives such as uh, sequestration of the jury or uh, changing a venue aren't going to mitigate the impacts of uh, statements, extrajudicial statements in this case and are unlikely to do so. Thus, the state contends that the order is an appropriate measure of the court to uphold its duty under Shepard, Nebraska Press Association, and the like to preserve the right to a fair and impartial trial. At a minimum, um, Mr. Gray's statements that he's not bound by trial pub publicity rules or 3.6 in this case illustrate why the order of the court is necessary um, in this matter. And so we would ask that the court uphold the amended non-dissemination order or at most uh, tailor it to um, those statements specifically precluded in Rule of Professional Conduct 3.8. I think you can tailor it a little bit more narrowly. Do you think that would be helpful to just, and I, I asked uh, Mr. Gray this the same question. Uh, Mr. Gray did not ask to say, answer it. Okay, you can say these things, but you can't say these things and be more specific about that? Your Honor, I, our initial position is that the total prohibition of extrajudicial statements is the safest and most um, responsive way in this case Total to prohibition? address um, and Sir. preserve the right to a fair and impartial trial. Yeah, okay. Right. Can you, can you uh, go back? You mentioned I, this you go about off. the standard, standard particularly applied to, uh, to the lawyers. Do y'all see the different way that the court, we're going to learn to read courts together. Do y'all see the different way that the court is engaging with this attorney? The way that the court is asking questions right now is the court asking the attorney to give the argument that the court wants to rule on. So he's like, can you address this? That means that this judge is like, hey, I want you to make these arguments. And so as an attorney, you have to be, um, no, well, it's hard when you're new because you're nervous, but you have to be comfortable enough in court, which is why attorneys that don't appear in court often miss these types of cues. You have to be comfortable enough to see the direction this judge is going in and to know that when he's asking, can you address this? 
what he's saying is give me the language that I can rule on because I want to make this ruling. And the judge is signaling that he's already not super thrilled with the argument being made by the Gonsalves family, in my opinion. That's how I'm reading this. So he's saying to the prosecution, can you address this issue for me? So it's very different in the way that he was sparring with the attorney for the Gonsalves family. So we're just, we're reading court together. I figure I can explain the rules because we're court casting and I love it so much. Are somehow connected with the case. Like, tell me more about yes, that. Yes, Your Honor. I, in Nebraska Press Association v. Stewart, it's noted that the, um, I believe Justice Brennan states that there's no doubt that the court has authority, though uh, it, it's in a footnote, it's no doubt that the court has authority to regulate the speech of attorneys, witnesses, um, and other participants in the court process. At this point, the evidence that's been provided is that the family would be potential witnesses in the case, as Mr. Thompson mentioned. Um, we ne haven't necessarily been able to make a full assessment of that, but undoubtedly they'd be uh, witnesses in any sentencing. And what about the standard? Strict yes. scrutiny or, or lower, lower standard? Your Honor, in, um, we would argue that Tell me the, the court should apply the standard in Gentile versus State Bar of Nevada, where the court, uh, Supreme Court stated that, um, I don't want to mess this up, I'm going to click here, That's fine. that the speech of lawyers may be regulated um, under a less, uh, less demanding standard. So we would argue that so long as the court finds that um, it has a duty under Shepard to preserve the right to a fair and impartial trial, that the order addre uh, responds, uh, addresses the substantial likelihood that pretrial, uh, that negative pretrial publicity would have on that right, then the court would have authority to impose the amended non-dissemination order. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, I think um, a lot has already been said, and obviously we wrote a lot in the briefing, so I guess I'll just touch on that. This is now probably. the motion argument for um, the defense. In terms of the argument This that is Koberger's chief litigation attorney. The victim's families are not uh, involved in the litigation of this case, and that's where we're going to fall in 3.6. would be our position that if you have statutory and constitutional rights involved in this case, you're involved in the litigation. Regardless of whether or not the prosecution is willing to work closely with you or whatever issue you have there, the reality is if you have mm, literal feels rights a bit broad to me. that permit you certain things that are involved in this case, you're involved in litigation. Uh, and therefore you fall within 3.6 just like everyone else. I don't like making this broad. So the standard from Gentile is the uh, substantial likelihood of material prejudice. I don't want to get too much into that, but I think that's kind of this afternoon's argument. I think that the main thing before the court, uh, as far as Mr. Gray and the family, uh, is just to fall within this and then the court to decide you know, what what is appropriate. But I would note that given the vast amount of uh, media coverage in this case, uh, the fact that it seems like no matter what anybody says or does, how much media coverage is in a case does not determine the rights of the First Amendment. It, The fact that there's a lot of media coverage versus not a lot of media coverage is not the determining factor on whether a gag order can extend to the attorney for a victim's family. That's not the question at hand here. And that is, it's interesting to see the prosecution and defense so aligned on this, but it's, it well... We'll see, but it's that's not the standard. That's just not the standard. In one way, shape, or form, it will be twisted into an attack on my client. Uh, Sir, if there wasn't so much of a gag order, you could respond to what the media is saying about your client. It's why in the Petito case, 
Once it was clear that the burn after reading letter was coming in, both attorneys are like, no, we don't want confidentiality. Let the public see the whole thing. And then they can both talk about it and they can both address it and they can both argue one side or the other of it. But no, this is no, no. We also agree that at this point, the safest thing is for them is not be talking to the media. It's got to be hard to be accused of a quadruple homicide in a high profile case. The mm -hmm. media gets all that information. If they still choose to do what it is they've been doing, then that's on them. But we don't have somebody who's trying to whip the media into a frenzy and send this case uh, to the firing squad or the probability of He's worried that someone is going to whip the media in the frenzy to send this case to the firing squad. Keep in mind, firing squad is actually an option in Idaho that that's a whole nother conversation. But I don't think the, I mean, the prosecution is obligated to make that decision based on their office policies and their duty to the constitution of the state wherein they work not because the media is coming for them, though I realize that prosecutors do bend the knee to the media. I don't like it, but it happens. Uh, it's an interesting argument that he's talking about the frenzy that the media can create. So that's our main uh, concern. The only other thing that I wanted to address and the court address this a little bit, uh, the reason we stand silent with grand jury indictments is because there's- Ooh. Ooh. He's going to explain why they stood silent for the grand jury indictments. Fascinating. The reason we stand silent with grand jury indictments is because there's an old arcane rule that says that if you have a grand jury indictment and you enter a plea, you are accepting the validity of the indictment. I haven't seen a prosecutor try to use that in a long time, but we can avoid any possible claims that somehow we can't challenge anything with the indictment by simply standing silent and having the court. It's fair. Just so that everybody's clear. <laughs> he was like, let me explain the strategy. Okay. Thank you for that. He wanted to explain the strategy. Interesting. Education. Thank you. All right. Mr. Gray, it's your motion. Final so thoughts. you can respond to what other counsel. Final thoughts, uh, Mr. Gray. Um, I guess the first thing I would want to address is the prosecution's idea that I have allowed our clients to speak with the investigators. You'll realize that the, uh, the yeah. day of the incident. I want that address too. I wasn't retained on this case until close to December 5th. This will be more than three weeks after the incident occurred. And they still have made no contact as far as investigating and interviewing. Sir! Before they make an arrest in this case, it's not unusual that they're not going to have a ton of conversation with the decedent's family. It would be not an interview. It would be minimal conversation while there's still an ongoing investigation pre-arrest, unless there was reason to believe that the parents somehow had information that's going to lead them directly to an arrest. But they clearly didn't think that they were going after digital evidence. I'm not... Uh, I'm not I want to hear what else he's going to say. Uh, they can stand. So somehow that I precluded that in some way, it's just, it's just not true, Your Honor. Huh. And as far as scheduling uh, those things, I'll just leave it at that. Um, the huh. second part is everyone uh, is quoting the Gentile case. The Gentile case he is says exactly it doesn't apply. like all of the other cases. Yeah, he's like, that doesn't apply. It says over and over, it has to be a lawyer participating in the judicial proceedings. It has to be a lawyer who represents a defendant involved with the criminal justice system, a lawyer actively participating in trial, a lawyer who's participating before the courts, or can only be limited if he's participating in front of the courts. None of it applies to me. It seems like you're in the court right now. Because you're the one <laughs> talking here because of the... Look at the judge's face. Well, sir. You're involved, aren't you? Hmm. Interesting to see the different demeanors between the judge, the the judge between the different attorneys. The, uh, the judge doesn't like this um, complaining, I don't think. You brought yourself yeah, well. Hold on. I'm backing that. I'm backing that up because 
th there's more sparring happening. Applies to me. It seems like you're in the court right now. Because you're the one that brought me here because of the non discrimination. You brought yourself here. Yeah, well, you're the one who filed the motion. I did file the motion because <laughs> the, 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 the non dissemination order is, is unconstitutional. I'm just trying to clarify what you just said. Well, this will probably be the only time I'm allowed because <laughs> I don't have the authority to file any other motions on anything else in this case. Why, because, why would you say that? Well, because I'm not a party to the case. You can still, I mean, the media is not a party of the case. They're either. interveners. Once again, they, well, the Supreme Court has said they have standing to come in to the court and address issues. So, yeah, but that's completely separate. They're not. Well, I know it's separate. Okay. So, I also, th I also uh, respect uh, your position in representing the families. The judge uh, is like, okay, okay. Victim, the family's victim. The victim's family. The family. Sir. And uh, and I respect that. And there's a certain, there are some constitutional issues, rights that they have. So I'm not I'm not just uh, dismissing that. And, and the mere fact that you have a right, I, I, I'm absolutely positive that the Idaho uh, legislature and the Constitution, when they gave victims rights, didn't didn't think that that was implementing those victims into the trial in some way. Absolutely positive that wasn't your intention. Totally so, agree with that. so this idea that if you have rights, then you're involved is just beyond. Um, that being said, Your Honor, did you drop your phone? Nothing precluded the prosecution from contacting uh, my clients well before I was representing them. I had almost three weeks to uh, contact them. Um, I, don't, I think. And don't mark me on this. I think I was retained on December 5th. I think that was the day. I don't have my file in front of me, but it will hold me to it. But I think that was the day. So they had plenty of time to contact my clients and interview them if they were going to be potential uh, witnesses in this case. And since then, every time we have had a meeting, we have initiated that conversation. It hasn't been the prosecution in, uh, initiating that conversation. So, so are you saying since, since you have been representing uh, your clients that uh, the prosecutor or investigators have not asked for that's what he just said. I would say this. In the meetings that I have had with the prosecution's office. When the court asks you a yes or no question, and you have to say, I will say this, it means you're not being entirely forthcoming with the court, which is not going to go well. And we have noticed. The law nerds are like, sir. You're not being forthcoming. Why? I have asked, as part of that, whether interviewing my clients might be an issue. Would they like to do that in some way? I've offered that up in some way. And they've never taken this up. And uh -huh, the prosecutor's shaking his head. Here and there that says something and no follow-up whatsoever about anything. So... Huh. This idea that they are going to be witnesses in this case is just an attempt by the prosecution to shut them up as well as to shut me up. And by the way, I, 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 people completely forget about this. All of the information that has been disseminated to the public from the get-go was the mayor, Art Bethy. Uh, Chief Fry had interviews. Bill Thompson had interviews. The coroner had interviews. All of those people had interviews. We didn't. We didn't until we, we started getting information and started trying to figure out what was going on after they had given interview after interview after interview. That was the purpose of the judge issuing the non-dissemination order, is huh. to quiet them up, not quiet the victims up. They had the purpose of the non-dissemination order was to quiet the prosecution and law enforcement from giving interviews, not the victim's families. And he is saying that the prosecution is the one trying to shut up the victim's family. He keeps using the word shut up and trying to shut up, which is interesting in court, and trying to shut him up from talking. That's very interesting. No control over that investigation from the get -go. That, that order was a stipulation between That's the state and, and Mr. Coburger. 
That's the other thing, though, bing, is bing, that bing. the court, after that Zoom meeting, Judge Marshall incorrectly says that that was stipulated by all parties. I never stipulated to that. You're I not a party. a party. No, 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 sir. Wait, sir, sir, no. The court said that was stipulated to by all parties. He said, I didn't stipulate. You have spent 40 minutes arguing that you're not a party. So when it's saying all parties stipulated, you're still not a party. You don't get to flip flop, swip swap if you're a party or not a party because you didn't have to stipulate because you're not a party and you just argued that you weren't a party. And the judge said, yes, we all agree that you're not a party. All the parties stipulated. I didn't stipulate. You're not a party. Stop swip swapping your arguments, sir. I backed up a little bit because I just wanted to hear it again. Control over that investigation from the get-go. Well, that, that order was a stipulation between the state and, and Mr. Koberger. That's the other thing, though, is that the court, after that Zoom meeting, Judge Marshall incorrectly said that that was stipulated by all parties. I never stipulated to that. I emailed the You're judge. Not a party. Exactly right. I'm not involved in the case. The stipulation was between the parties. So as you correctly stated, you are not who a party. The parties are. So we would ask. I agree, but you you were suggesting that that it was entered to to, to shut down the prosecutor's office. Why would they? That's claim, what you just said. I, I I do think that part of the uh, that was part of the process is that they understood that their their investigation was getting out of hand. Too many people were talking in their investigation, and that's why they stipulated to it. Yes, I do. Okay, when you say they, you mean the prosecutor? Yes, office. yes. Oh. All right. Do you are need we to done? A final, or do you, go, go, go are we done? Day, right? Are we you, done? You oh, gosh. You're not a part of the case. You're very aware of that. I have the right to, to repeat what my clients say uh, to the media. I also have an independent right that I'm governed by uh, the Idaho Rules of Professional Conduct regarding those individual rights versus my own opinions. But those opinions, I don't firmly believe, would fall under the, the um, publicity uh, rule on the Idaho Rules of Professional Conduct because I'm not litigating it or part of the litigation. And the reason those things are in place are because people that have real privy information regarding the prosecution and the defense, which I don't, which my clients don't in any way, no one stopped it your clients from talking Thank except you. for you. Thank you, Mr. Green. All right. Well, I'm not going to issue a, a uh, decision today. Uh, uh, I'm going to issue a written decision. Uh, there is a lot of briefing. And yeah, there is. Some very interesting uh, argument today. And the argument uh, was exactly the same as the briefing. That to work and try to get a decision out as as soon as possible. Great. So, uh, anything else we need to address before... Is the I video out for the other hearing yet? Mr. Thompson? I don't think so, yeah. Ms. Taylor? Mr. Thompson? Hey, PR, we just... We thought you'd probably want to issue an order and wait, but I guess we're just wondering if in the meantime, the order as it is remains in place. Yes. Thank you. It, it remains in place. The defense is clarifying that the order that is in place remains in place until the court rules on this motion. So I address it. So with that, uh, we are adjourned. Adjourned. Thank you all. Okay. That is the first hearing of the day that we have just completed. Um, thanks to the court TV cameras being there in court. And there is still a hearing that I think has concluded based on Chanley Painter from court TV's coverage over on Twitter. It looks like that hearing has concluded, but we'll see. And that second hearing of the day is regarding the media's motion with regard to the gag order. So I'm going to answer questions about this hearing and the other things we were talking about. If we don't see that other hearing pop up, I will go back to the um, motions that we were covering. So we will continue to cover it. Uh, here's the thing. 
there is, and I saw a number of questions about this, so I'm going to talk about that first. There can be tension between victims' families and the prosecution. It happens. It has happened in my cases. I hated it when it happened. But when you have a case where you cannot give the victims what they want, it can be very frustrating to them because it doesn't feel like justice is being done. If there is a plea agreement that they don't like, if there is a, um, a choice of charges that they don't like, as a prosecutor, you are bound by the Constitution and by the law and by your ethical duty as an attorney. So you cannot and should not overreach. I realize that some do, but you you can't. Our system doesn't work if those that wield power aren't honest. So there are times that victims' families get frustrated, and I completely understand it. This family feels frustrated, or at least their attorney feels frustrated to me. I have not watched the um, the interviews with um, Mr. Gonsalves. I have not looked at those yet. I will over the weekend. Look, it was VPR week. I can only do so much. I'm behind on Jersey. I haven't watched OC yet. My girl, Emily Simpson is on there. Like I haven't, I am behind. So, cause Dave, but I understand the tension here and the frustration of a family that wants answers and a prosecution whose job it is first to protect the constitutional rights of the defendant and to protect the constitution protect the constitution in the way they go about the prosecution, those things come first. So if they are in a world or a, a, a position where they can't disclose parts of the investigation to the victim's family because they feel that it will end up in the media, I can understand that tension. And it's hard. It's a hard tension. But the prosecution has to focus on making sure that a prosecution is carried out ethically and lawfully first. And that is their first goal. That is their first job, that any prosecution stands. And so it's hard. I don't think the victim's families are silenced by the gag order. The argument here, here, let me swoop. Let me swoop so I can give you just the real quick argument on this part. The argument here from the Gonsalves family attorney is that the Gonsalves family attorney is limited in what he can say based on the gag order. Nothing is limiting the family from speaking. It's limiting him from speaking. And what he is saying is that I, as the attorney, should not be silenced. I have a First Amendment right, and I am not a party, and my family is not a party. So the family can speak but the lawyer can't speak. And the lawyer is saying, I should be able to say what the family says. I should be able to represent their interests to the media. I should be able to give statements. The prosecution is saying this, and the defense too, that the gag order is not overbroad, leave it. And that this attorney is actually covered by it because they are potentially witnesses. They are potentially witnesses if this goes to a death penalty case. If there is a conviction, the family of the victims will testify most likely or be called to testify at the penalty phase of the trial if it's a death penalty trial, if that all makes sense. And then technically in that way, they are witnesses. So that's the tension in the motion between the Gonsalves family attorney and the court and trying to navigate what the attorney is allowed to say. And at this point, I feel like the attorney is saying, you can't take away my right to speak. Well, the attorney can go speak and see if the court sanctions him. I don't think he wants to go that way. He very much wants the court to make a, a more specific ruling, and I don't think the court's going to. I think the court is going to leave the gag order as is. I think the right result is probably the court reverting back to the original gag order, not the expanded or extended or enlarged or embiggened gag order. I think the first gag order was sufficient. This attorney clearly wants to talk or just wants the court to make a ruling that he can, one way or the other, but the family can still talk. The, the family seems frustrated with the prosecution as well. Um, and I get that. 
And I don't know if the attorney is making a wedge there or not. Second gag order hearing that happened this afternoon that is not available yet, but if it is, we will, we will get there. So the second gag order hearing is, is slightly different because it's the media coalitions and the media coalitions in that second gag order are arguing that their right to report on the case is being infringed. This is different. The media's right is different than the attorney's own First Amendment right. The media is arguing that they can't gather information and report because law enforcement is locked down, the lawyers are all locked down, and there's no one for them to talk to. I mean, it hasn't stopped them. How many videos have you seen? I'm not the only one making videos on this, but I'm just covering the court documents and the court hearings. But if you look at the amount of coverage, there is daily coverage on some outlets speculating about this case daily. Like, I don't know how hampered they've been. They feel constrained. And there were how many of these um, declarations in support of motion are there? Here, let me go and share my screen. When we're looking at the media motion, and that's the second, when we're looking at the media motion regarding the gag order, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine declarations of people in the media saying we are not able to get the 911 call. We are not able to get all of this information that we want to get. And when we ask people for information, they keep saying no because of the gag order. You know why? They don't want to talk to you. And saying, oh, no, there's a gag order, so sorry, is a total easy cop-out. Me as a prosecutor, all the time. This was me all the time. Can I talk to media? Can I talk to you about this case? My supervisor's number is this and media relations number is this. Thanks. Click. I didn't want to talk to the media at all, ever. And if people got really pissed at me, especially early in my career, I'd be like, I have four supervisors. Which one of them would you like to talk to? Because I can't change a decision about anything without all of their approval. So if you would like to talk to all of these supervisors, here they are. This one, that one, that one, and that one. Go talk to them. I will happily be there with you in that meeting. I can set a meeting with all of my supervisors. But I can't change this for anything. I don't have the authority to. So I know that you want to yell at me, but I am just your line prosecutor standing here without authority to do anything else. So sorry. And then there were times when I had defense attorneys I just really couldn't deal with, and I'd be like, you can talk to my supervisor about that peace. And then I go to my supervisor and be like, so I'm sorry. I literally couldn't with this person in court today. And I didn't want to start yelling. So I just told them they had to call you. So you might be getting a phone call about that. Sorry. Bye. <laughs> That's what you're getting paid more for. You're getting paid more to deal with this kind of shit that I don't want to deal with. So I understand that the attorneys and all of law enforcement is like, oh, so sorry, there's a gag order. I don't want to talk to you. Bye. They don't want to talk to the media. They don't want things they say to be misconstrued. They don't want people trying to find where they live. They don't want to become the center of a shit storm. None of them do. None of them want the media attention on them. Except maybe Judge Judge. Judge Judge didn't seem to mind being on camera. I don't think Judge Judge is here for the media at all. I think this will be a very feisty um, a very feisty, very feisty hearing this afternoon. But I think Judge Judge is like, hmm, <laughs> tell me more about that. I think Judge Judge enjoys being a judge, don't you? I saw a question earlier, and I'm going to get to some questions while we, and then I'll get back to, um, I'll get back to the motions because we got a long day ahead of us, it seems. So let's see what, I got a question about, are we calling Judge 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 Judge? Trisha, we're not naming Judge, 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 Judge. His name is John C. Judge, and he's the judge. We don't even have to name him. So it just happened. Isn't that a delight for us? So let's, Judge, Judge was definitely having a good time. Let's just get to questions real quick. We're going to answer some super chats, and then if that other hearing is up, we will go to it. If not, we will go to the rest of the motions. If we don't get to all the motions today, I will cover them on Tuesday.
I, uh, I have, I have done something to my stream. Hold on. I've got, I was trying to move around my, uh, I was trying to make this work and move around my, um, move around my windows. I need a, I need a stream center like JB. His stream center is great. <laughs> so I need a JB style stream center. Okay. Now I can see it's hard. It's hard sometimes to be able to read the comments and to look at you and not always be looking at my second monitor. I might need to change my monitor setup. Do I need a bigger monitor? Maybe I do before our next trial stream. Jay Michael, good to see you. My kid just got braces. Fantastic. And congrats. It's my birthday and Johnny Depp's too. Casey Cat, happy birthday. Hold on. There was, I was looking for applause. I need to put this. Uh, uh, uh. There, now I can see it better. Happy birthday. I'm sure there are others in the chat that it, it, if, it's, if it's your birthday, go shorty. It's your birthday. Happy TGIF. EDB was so glad to get your text. I'm so glad to be live covering court hearings. I love covering live court. You might have realized this about me at this point. Covering live court is kind of my favorite. I like watching. I like watching what everybody's doing. I love it. I love covering live court. The motions are always fun because fuck, man. Yesterday's stream was a really good time. You might have been able to tell. Could you tell? Could you tell I was having fun yesterday? I really enjoyed yesterday. Um, but I like I like the change up between covering live hearings and covering um and covering uh motions. Question, why did he wear a suit and tie? I thought that was only in front of the jury. No, he's allowed to wear civilian clothes to any court hearings. He might just have wanted to uh to change. So it might just be a want to change. Um, I just saw somebody that passed their boards. Where did that go? I wanted to give you a shout out by name and the chat is just jumping, jumping. Congratulations on passing your boards. Ah, Kathleen, congratulations. Yay. That's exciting news. Tamara said, thank you for keeping me company through my burnout these past few months. Burnout is the worst. Give yourself lots of space and grace. You've helped me get rid, get my mind off things. I'm happy to be here. That is one of the things this community is really beautiful for. We're always here. There's lots of content to just hang out with us and feel like you're in a safe space because you are. BJ says, so thrilled I found you. You make my days and months more interesting. Thank you. And hysterically funny on many days. A quirk. <laughs> Singing for us now. It sometimes, I don't always mean to be funny. Sometimes I do. But most of the time I just want to chat about the things that are in my brain. Homeboy really brought his college age kids into it. Yes, he did yesterday. He sure did. If I was a college age kid, I would be pissed. Um, my Ida said from the Murdoch trial and may come up here. You said the state can't appeal if they lose. Why not? Can't a judge make a decision that cost their case and they could be found inappropriate on appeal? This is a fantastic question. I'm so glad you asked it. Let's chat real quick. In a prosecution, so a, a, um, a, a criminal case, the state's the prosecutor. There are things the judge can do that the state can appeal. But if you get to the end of a trial and a defendant is acquitted, jeopardy has attached. So even if the state appeals a ruling, the trial can't be overturned because jeopardy has attached. So if they are acquitted, there is nothing the state can do about it. It's a little easier in pretrial motions, but the state can't, there's no recourse on appeal. Even if the judge did something wrong that caused the acquittal, there is no recourse once the acquittal is done. Could the state ask the court to declare a mistrial in the middle of trial because of something? In some circumstances, yes, they can say, your honor, we have to declare a mistrial and start this trial over again, but it depends on the circumstances and it depends on the judge. So that is, is the case. Once jeopardy is attached, if a defendant is acquitted, there is nothing that can be done. New evidence comes out later that shows it's 100% them. They cannot be prosecuted twice for the same crime. There is a small asterisk to that when you are dealing with state and federal quirks on certain types of crimes, but that's a very deep dive that I don't think you're asking about. So generally, if a defendant is acquitted, there is nothing else that can be done. That is their right. They cannot be twice put in jeopardy. That is double jeopardy. Christy said, even if we had just given a script to AH that said X, 
it wouldn't be the same as hearing, seeing her testimony. Video makes a huge difference in perception and really knowing what happens. I agree with you. Seeing how people testify. Words are different, right? And the words of, of a judge can be taken differently depending on how it's said. So just reading it on the record isn't the same as hearing the tone, seeing the facial expressions, seeing how fast uh, the conversation is happening. True, 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 true. Speaking of Depp, his 60th birthday is today. Happy birthday to Johnny Depp. Emily D. Baker, I love the work you do keeping us informed. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. One Emily's whimsical world from one Emily to another. So mad I have physical therapy right now. Going to try to sneak you in with me. Do they not let you watch stuff at physical therapy? Hope so. Physical therapy is hard. It's always hard. Do your exercises, Jen. They're, they're needed. I never do well at that. I worry, however, that regardless of the verdict, it will be under tight scrutiny if a judge decides to bar cameras. Yes, in every high-profile case, not being able to see it. I mean, jury verdicts get called into question even when people can watch it. Imagine what happens when you can't watch it. Um, Age finally paid the $1 million settlement. Well, her insurance did. We're going to circle back to that. I meant, I meant to do it this week. Stuff happened. I'm hoping to do it Tuesday, but if we have to carry over this stream to Tuesday, then it'll be Thursday, but we're going to get back to the Amber Heard um, appeal. And I'm contemplating, contemplating doing some of the, some of the testimony from that trial that I did not cover. I didn't cover the cross-examination of um, Dr. Curry because I was traveling. There's a few other witnesses I missed. I'm contemplating going back with y'all for like a one year retrospective and covering a few of the things that I had missed uh, in the early days of that trial when I was traveling. Um, can we be honest? The judge, the prosecution doesn't want to be analyzed, but sure, the defendant, the jury, what about freedom of the speech and press? That's the balance that the judge has to balance. And yes, they don't want to be scrutinized. I think the judge needs to start listening to EDB. The judge is clearly listening to some of the media, but not us. The judge is paying attention to legacy media. That's true. And that might be the problem. Couldn't it be helpful to the attorneys to see how the public watching live streams of the trial is responding, commenting on the case? I think there are savvy attorneys that feel that way. I think there are lots of attorneys that do not feel that way at all, that do not want any input at all. So I think that might change as um, lawyers understand the power of crowdsourcing media. But I think it's only truly internet savvy attorneys that feel that way. Is BK required to attend these or is it his choice? Um, on the gag order motions, he doesn't have to be present, but I think it would, I mean, I imagine it would be better than just sitting in custody. I mean, it gives you something to do. I imagine he's going to want to be at every single hearing, wouldn't you? I mean, what else are you going to do with your time? I would want to know everything that's being said. I would want to see everything that's going down. So is he required? No, it's not really about him specifically. So he could have probably not been there or they could have asked the court for him not to be there. I think he's going to be everywhere. Question, can the families be considered witnesses if they are willing to testify? The families, Wendy, it's a good question. They're witnesses because of the penalty phase, because there may be a penalty phase if this is a death penalty case, but they're not witnesses to the crime um, at, in any way. So they're not, they're not witnesses to the crime. The prosecution for Brooks' case seemed to be uh, some involved and dedicated to all the victims. Why is it different here? The victims seemed to feel very honored by the way that the prosecution brought them in. The prosecution team also seemed to have a very good victim witness advocate. Prosecutors' offices often have it victim witness advocates that work with them. But the Brooks case just is such a different situation. And they, they needed to work with most of the victims' families because the victims' families were also percipient witnesses to the thing. Most of the victims' families were also there at the parade. So it is a slightly different case. And the investigation there wasn't so secretive. They were all at the parade. So they were they were there. Um, so it's just a really different circumstance. I would hope all prosecutors would be able to communicate well with the victims. I know that that does not always happen. I know that that does not always happen. It was something that I... I did everything I could to make sure I was a part of, but there's times that you would get cases as a prosecutor and talk to the victim's family and be like, has anyone talked to you yet? And they're like, no, we've heard nothing. And you're like, how the fuck does that happen? 
but it happens. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to rose color glasses, everything. It happens, especially in big agencies. I mean, there are times that victims or victims families will try to contact victims, witness assistance and get no call back for months. It's hard. Uh, it really, really is hard. Speculation. Thank you, Kristen, for, for couching it as speculation. I watched something where it seemed like Gonsalves was uh, the one he intended to see that night. I wonder if they want a separate trial. They're not going to get a separate trial. Um, this is going to go forward with all of the victims. Because there's not different defendants, this is going to go forward because the circumstance of the events and the the um, the timing of events, this all happened in one circumstance or one act of events. So it's not going to be broken up into multiple different trials. Uh, I mean, even if they want that, they're not going to get it. What's the goal of the hearing? Trisha, the goal of the hearing today was for the gag order to be removed from the Gonsalves um, family attorney or to be removed or clarified. That was the goal of the hearing. The judge said, I'll rule on that later. The circuit judge in my county and AR put gag orders on every criminal trial and abuses them. So I struggle with accepting their use and abusing gag orders is not good at all. I don't like that at all. The court process is supposed to be transparent, but I think some judge will argue endo. I think some judges will argue, okay, then um, show up in court, show up in court if you want to see what happens. And that's difficult too. Not everybody can. Debbie, the family has been fighting for Kaylee for months now. I feel like someone just needs to tell them you can stop fighting now. You'll get justice for your little girl. You need to stop. I, I don't know what you can tell grieving parents that will make them feel like they're doing something. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how, how you help grieving parent, parents through the court process. I don't know if there's any right way to do it. There's no right way to grieve. Grief and trauma are really fucking weird <clears throat> and really hard. And I don't know what that's like. I've seen people go through it. I've been there where people go through it. And sometimes trying to fight is all that they have to keep going um, while they are still grieving and healing and while there are no answers. Because what every family wants to know at the core of it is why did this happen? Why did this happen to my family member? Why did this happen to their kid? And I, I think being kept at arm's length on that um, adds insult to injury for the families. And I understand there are times that the prosecution will do that. And I understand why I've been that prosecutor. There are times I've had to do that and it sucks for everybody. Um, the system is not set up to be easy for victims. The system is set up to protect the constitutional rights of the defendant and try to prosecute them. And that's, hard. So I don't think they're going to feel that they can, that they can put that down and really start to heal until this is done. And I understand that. I completely understand that. Um, and they're not, I don't know if they're going to get the answers that they want, even with a the prosecution there, there, they might get the how answers, but getting the why answers is tough. Um, <clears throat> Mandy Mee said, Chanley says they're on the second witness in the hearing. Oh, so they're still going. So that hearing's not done yet. We might not get to that. Um, we might not get to that hearing today then because it's going to be a while before it's released. Uh, EDB, have you had a case where the relationship with victim family members was strained? Yes. How would you handle this? It's hard. It's real hard. Uh, I feel terrible. There is bad blood. It sometimes it is unavoidable. Sometimes it is, un it is unavoidable. There was a particularly difficult case where the family wanted wanted everything to be done that could be done to the defendant. And under the law, there was little that could. Um, I don't talk about the details of that case much. It is a very difficult case. It was a difficult, I understood where they were coming from, but that was not the just right or ethical thing to do. And um, I did what was, well, what I still believe to be just right and ethical uh, and they did not agree with me. So, and that is really tough. And I understand why they don't agree because they're mad. So I get it. 
it's weird as a prosecutor, you don't always know that um, everyone will be mad at you in some cases, but it's true. Everyone will be mad at you in some cases and you have to do what you are ethically obligated to do, which is why being a prosecutor is not easy. Why does Koberger have to be present? I think Koberger on this one chose to be present. I would. Real question is what does ChatGPT's case law say? That I should ask ChatGPT what the case law says about whether a victim's family's attorney has a First Amendment right and whether that can be curtailed by a gag order of the court. Question, how are you a witness at sentencing? Lori, this is a great question. It's not at sentencing. So if this case is a death penalty case, there will be a penalty phase in front of a jury. And if there is a penalty phase in front of a jury, they will be witnesses at that penalty phase. If this is not a death penalty case, then there is um, then there is a sentencing, and then they would be making victim impact statements at sentencing. They're not witnesses then, so it's because it could be a death penalty case. And until the state says that it's not, everyone involved has to assume that it is. Question, shouldn't the judge hold his composure, regardless of the attorney speaking or approach? Oh, that judge was very composed. That was his demeanor. <laughs> judges are, judges have various levels of demeanor and snark. Um, so the, I didn't think that judge was outside of composure at all. You could just see he was enjoying himself. Being able to read a judge is a, is a, is a skill that is needed, but no, that, that was that judge's temperament. Um, gosh, the way I've seen judges yell. Mm. Uh, yeah, they're not, they're not just flat affected. You're awesome. Emily. Thank you. Much love from Zur Zurich. Thank you, Amalia. Much love back at you. If the gag order is lifted and the family goes to the media and new info is a new, new info, not released. Could that prejudice a trial or conviction? Well, the, the worry is that any info release could prejudice a potential jury. So that's the concern. The attorney was arguing the family doesn't have any information, but the family's not bound by the gag order. The attorney is, and that gag order has not been lifted yet. Does Gray have an uphill battle to fight, or is he just not lawyering well? No, he has an uphill battle. This is the first hearing. This is for the first hearing of this live. He has an uphill battle. This judge is not inclined to acquiesce to his request. And the case law is not really clear because this extends, I think, the gag order is overbroad. But I don't think the court is going to do what he wants. I think the court might clarify it a little bit more, but the court's not going to get, excuse me, the court's not getting rid of this gag order. He wants to make sure it doesn't apply to him. And the court's like, well, you're kind of involved. So yes, he has an uphill battle. Um, is the family required to testify if it is a death penalty case? Not required. Or can they say they don't want to? It really depends. I hate that answer. I hate that answer that it really depends, but it really just depends on the circumstances. Could they be subpoenaed to testify even if they don't want to? Yes, but it really, really, really depends. Um, so I'm driving to Ocean City, New Jersey for vacation. Have an apple cider donut. Yes, and Mac and Manko's pizza. Hi, Dr. B. I'm still streaming. What's up? No, what's up? Nothing. Hi. Hi. Hi, T. Everybody's home. You made an Oreo milkshake. That sounds delicious. Did you did you make me an Oreo milkshake? No, I'm streaming. Okay. Oreo will get in my teeth. <laughs> um, the chat says hi. <laughs> Dr. B's like, great. Starting my master's degree in social work this fall because of you. Congratulations. Get it, Allison. Took the jump to apply. Will be an LCSW in 2026. Doing incredible work. Thank you for the work that you will be doing. Remember to take care of yourself in social work and that that having therapy <laughs> is going to be helpful. Um, pay attention to everyone that talks about secondary trauma and make sure that you go into your educational program setting boundaries and taking care of yourself. It's really easy to set that aside and be like, I'll pick up healthy habits later. You, you will not. Establish those while you're in your program and take care of yourself. Going to school to be a paralegal in the fall. Congratulations. Everything I just said also applies. Um, your boundaries are going to be with lawyers. Here's my secret to lawyers, to a lot of lawyers. Um, <clears throat> a lot of time lawyers are hungry. They forget to eat. Feed them. 
If they, if you really need to talk to them, do it right after lunch and make sure they've eaten lunch. Feed your lawyers, especially the super cranky ones. They need to eat. And often they don't hydrate because they can't build to go to the bathroom. So lawyers don't want to have to pee like six times a day. So they just try not to go to the bathroom. They are dehydrated and they forget to eat. Feed them, bring them snacks. Feed the lawyers. They will be, they will be better. They will be better if you do. <sighs> okay. So thank you, Miguelina. We might not get to that today. Yes, do a retro of JDAH. I might, I think I might, um, when we have time, pick up the the few hearings that I missed and go over those all together. So treat lawyers like nur nurses. Yes. <laughs> Though they're not saving lives. They're, they're, they do need to be fed. Uh, Carol said, hello, Emily. I just wanted to say that my mother and I always watch your streams on the JD trial. She passed on December 14th. I'm sorry. I've been watching you to cope. It's helped a lot. Thank you so much. Carol, I'm so sorry for the loss of your mom. That is a that is a very, very difficult and complicated grief journey. The Lawnards are here, and hopefully your mom is still hanging out with us too. Um, Matt Bond said they feel they failed here. Fighting is making up for it. I don't, I don't know how you would feel as a parent at all. I don't know how you would feel. Like you can only protect your kids so much, and the world is awful. And so I, I don't. I don't know how I would respond. I don't know how anyone would respond. And so I don't think they're ever going to start, stop fighting. Um, and, uh, and really let them feel like they have done enough to get justice for their daughter. So it's hard. It's a hard, hard thing. Um, Chanley is still tweeting about this hearing, this hearing we might have to cover on Tuesday. Cause that hearing has now been going on for over well over an hour plus, um, and there are multiple witnesses on it. So with multiple witnesses and a multi-hour plus hearing, that is going to be a lot for today. I'm going to go back and do the documents, and then we will do the rest of the hearing on Tuesday. Sorry, y'all. I don't. I just don't know if we're going to be able to get to it. We'll keep. We'll keep an eye as I do the documents. So let's do the documents first, and then go from there. All right, because we're already in it. We're already in it. So lawyers are like houseplants. Yes, they need sunlight. They need gentle music. They need water. And often they are hungry. Mm. There was a judge that I loved. Absolutely loved. Loved working with. Total kick in the pants. Sassy. A lot of fun. Made good jokes. Totally a delight. However, right around the holidays... He would always do like keto and he did not like doing keto. So there was like a three plus month window where it was just miserable to be in his courtroom. And I would just be, I would be with his court staff being like, is he almost done yet? Because, because I can't, I can't, he is so miserable when he is hungry. I just can't even deal with like i just don't want to appear in this court until like march will you let me know when he's done <laughs> and the court staff was like yeah and you couldn't bring snacks because then he would get mad that you brought snacks it was a mess but it was it was every single year every single year he was like, no not keto again he hates it the the things I knew about the judges I appeared in front of, I think I knew about as much of, I think I knew quite a lot about their ha habits and patterns as I did about my spouse. And that's the thing about practicing in courthouses regularly. And the reasons that you want local attorneys is because they know the habits and patterns of the judges. Um, and so they knew and, and I knew, and that's one of the things about being a, uh, being a good attorney is knowing the judges you have to know people and you have to like knowing people. And I think to be a good trial lawyer, you have to have that balance of like confidence, but getting your ego out of the way so that you actually are attending to the needs of other people around you. There are a lot of lawyers, especially, sorry, civil attorneys. There are some civil partners at big law that do not attend to those around them or the needs of those around them. And they're just like bull in a China shop. Good attorneys can attend to the needs of those around them and read the room well. Read the room really well. Um, all right. 
let's go back to these motions that we didn't finish and we will we will see where that takes us where were we mm, we did the we did the defendant's memorandum on cameras we didn't do the order for permitting zoom participation that's where we're at next so we're in the defense motions for the hearings today all right let's let's get this motion going Defense motion through his Jay Logston. This is the attorney that we saw talking in the earlier hearing today. The male defense attorney hereby moves the court order permitting participation via Zoom for Jean Saucier. Saucier? Saucier. To be available on Zoom at that date and time. This is for the 1.30 p.m. hearing that is still going. Um... If that's not possible, Mr. Koberger would request the hearing be continued. So it looks like the witness, the first witness they called was by Zoom. This motion is made on the grounds that Ms. Saucier is Mr. Koberger's witness for the amount and type of coverage this case has received, but is out of state and unable to appear in person on such short notice. Her testimony would be invaluable to understanding the data Mr. Koberger is presenting. So Koberger is presenting live witnesses regarding media coverage to argue about cameras in the courtroom and the gag order. Those two things are being discussed this afternoon S still. So that I think I understand the Gonsalves family feel like it is a very important motion. Their motion really only deals with their attorney. This deals with all of the media and potentially cameras in the courtroom. And that is a very big deal. Defendant's motion to shorten time. Koberger, through his attorney, asked for an order to shorten time. Uh, the defense motion to take judicial notice of press coverage and defendant's motion for order permitting Zoom participation. Let's go look at the um, motion regarding judicial notice of press coverage. We're going to go look at that now because I'm curious as to what they cited. The judge will probably just grant this order shortening time because it's basically saying, hey, uh, can you consider this before the hearing? These were all filed on June 6th. That's not statutory time for the hearing on June 9th, but also not a big deal. So I'm sure the judge just granted it. And I bet you that there wasn't a lot of fuss over it. Cause why would there be? It's like, eh, fine. You never know. Ray said in small and yes, <laughs> it is, it is being shortened and in small and, <laughs> um, what's the trial? Uh, I think the chat can answer that. Well, hopefully. All right. Motion to take judicial notice of press coverage. I want to see what press coverage they want judicial notice taken of. Uh, moves the honorable court to take judicial notice of press coverage of this case. No hearing is required for the court. We know that. Courts have routinely taken judicial notice of things like web pages and social media postings. Do y'all remember back in the day? Way back in the day when we were covering um, the Toddy Westbrook defamation case up in Washington. And one of the attorneys wanted to take judicial notice of a fuck ton of like YouTube videos and like shit. Trisha Paytas said it, it was a delight. <laughs> so let's see what they want judicial notice taken of. And the thing that's different here is they want judicial notice taken of the fact that these things exist, not the fact that these things are true. And there's a difference between take judicial notice of the veracity of the thing versus take judicial notice of the fact that this exists. So this is judicial notice of the fact that this is what exists. This is what's being said. So um, let's see. Koberger, uh, Mr. Koberger notes this court may simply take judicial notice on its own of any press coverage it's aware. He specifically requests the court to consider the attached articles. Um, I'm just going to read the titles of the articles. Hopefully y'all can see it here. Let's embiggen this a little bit. I can hear my kid working out. Um, my, my teen. Ugh. All right. Capital punishment. Families of Brian Koberger's quote victims. Why is victims in paren? Is it because, I mean, 
If you didn't say that they were Koberger's victims, maybe that's the issue because Koberger is presumed innocent. We don't know that Koberger is the person who did this. He has not been convicted yet. So I don't like putting victims in Perrin. I wish they would say families of Idaho murder victims will seek death penalty for Brian Koberger. And then you don't have to put victims in quotations because no matter who committed this murder, they are murder victims. Am I being picky? Maybe I'm being picky. They are murder victims. Whether Koberger is in fact the person who committed the murder is different. I think there's a different way to word that, but whatever. Oh, it's the U.S. son. Okay. Capital punishment. Families of Brian Koberger's victims will seek death penalty for Idaho murder suspect and speak on out on plea deal. Um, all, the, wrong. All of this is wrong. This is wrong. First of all, the victims don't get to seek the death penalty or not. The prosecution does that. That's a prosecution choice. They might ask the prosecution to seek that, but ultimately the victims don't seek the death penalty. That's not on them. Um, and if there is a plea deal, they will be consulted on that. But ultimately the choice is the prosecutors, not the victims. So just uh, wrong, wrong. Okay. Next one. Par parallels of evil. Ted Bundy survivors speak out likening their gruesome attacks to Brian Koberger's. Accused Idaho killer Brian Koberger's body language compared to Lee Harvey Oswald from the New York Post. Here's why Idaho student murder suspect Brian Koberger may have chosen to stand silent in court, experts say. Why are they mad about that? I mean, nobody knew until they said they knew. You know why nobody knew until they said they knew? Because the defense attorneys are under a gag order and the defense attorneys can't just say, hey, we're not accepting the findings of the grand jury, so we're standing silent. If there was no gag order, they could have just said that and then experts wouldn't be called to speculate on it. Hi, I'm an expert that got called to speculate on it. And I said, he has the right to do it. He can make that choice. Idaho murder victim's father has a warning for Brian Koberger, as they're allowed to. Um, if they are in over their heads, then acknowledge that. More than six weeks after Idaho murders, Kaylee Gonsalves' family lawyer questions if police are quote-unquote capable. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Gonsalves' family attorney speaks out on one-month anniversary of murders. I like that they are pointing, poking perhaps poking specifically at the Gonsalves family attorney, Mr. Gray. <laughs> They're definitely like, that's, um, that's not that much to take notice of. So, uh, that's, I mean, all right. I'm sure the court will be like, yeah, okay. Those, those headline, those, uh, they have touched, hold on. Did they attach them? I'm sure the court is like, okay, these headlines exist. Great. Sure. They exist. Okay. I'm, I'm sure the court's not going to have a problem with taking judicial notice of the fact that that exists. Okay. Um, objection to media's motion to vacate the amended non-dissemination order. We haven't done this either. There are so many motions. All right. This is the defendant's, these take so long to populate. This is the defendant's objection to the media's motion to vacate the amended non-dissemination order. I'm going to have to, quick bits is going to be fucking wild this week. I, there is no way that I am going to do that. Quick bits is going to be real tricky. <laughs> um... Defense objects to the motion to vacate the amended non-dissemination order on grounds that justification exists to support the continued exi justification exists to continue to support the continued existence of the amended non-dissemination order. Even if the court finds it's overbroad, it remains appropriate to have an order reminding lawyers and their agents of the rules of engagement in this country and that we try cases in court, not in the press. They are real salty about this. Why so much salt? Issue, whether the amended non-dissemination order violates the First Amendment. I think I covered this already. I feel like I covered this already, or at least part of it. Um, 
I think I covered this already because this was their mostly objection that the sixth amendment needs to be protected and that the balance between the sixth amendment and the first amendment is different. I think I did this already. So I am not going to do this again because well, we've done it already. And if I, ha if I'm wrong, I don't think I am. I will go back and cover this again, but they're going to argue this in court today saying our sixth amendment rights are more important. And in the balancing, um, in the balancing act, we still need a non-dissemination order. I think this case will have a gag order no matter what. It's just how narrowly tailored that is. We'll see. All right. Um, response to response states response to motion to appeal, amend, and or clarify. What is this? Okay, this is the state responding. I have not covered this. This is the state responding to the media's motion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> State's response to motion to appeal, amend, or clarify the amended non-dissemination order. Let's see what this state has. This is just notice. As Mr. Gray did not file any supplemental briefing, the state incorporates its previously filed memorandum. Oh, okay. They didn't do more, so I'm not doing more. Great. Delightful. Let's see. Stipulation for protective order. This we went over. Uh, no, we did not. This is a new one. The amount of filings in this case is quite a lot. Uh, comes now the above named parties by and through their undersigned attorneys. The protective order pertains to records obtained from the University of Idaho during the course of the investigation in this case. These records fall into two categories. Records pertaining to the victims in this case, Madison, Kaylee, Ethan, and Zana. Records from the University of Idaho pertaining to other individuals, including students, faculty, staff, uh, and records from the University of Idaho's Office of Civil Rights Investigation. Huh. Interesting. Um, oh, because there was a disciplinary action. That's probably where the disciplinary action is. Uh, okay. By way of background, the, the records of the University of Idaho are protected by various federal and state law, including uh, the FERPA, FERPA, as well as various state personal information privacy protections. The state has been advised by legal counsel for the University of Idaho that FERPA protections do not survive the death of the subject individually. Consequently, FERPA issues in this case do not apply to the University of Idaho records reg regarding the victims in this case. However, other personal privacy protections remain, including protected information as defined in Idaho criminal rule, IRAC. Uh, 16D1, the state will redact that information in accordance with the rule and the parties will comply with the protections afforded by said rule. This is really a, hey, your honor, we're redacting all of this shit as they should, as they should. Um, As to the University of Idaho records, other than those pertaining to the victims, the parties stipulate to the entry of a protective order limiting access of those records to direct review by defense counsel and with the provision that any further dissemination or use of those records will be prohibited absent a court order. So we'll give them to the defense and that is it. And then everything else will be redacted. Um, so Chanley says we've moved on to cameras in the courtroom. That is a very long hearing, a very long hearing. Let's see. Um, we did, uh, what was that? Okay, response to the Associated Press's motion to intervene. This is the state's response. It seems that the state and the defense are on the same page. I can't believe how many motions they dumped um, all at once. Uh, let's see. With the decision in the writ of Matt Damon, it is now this court's prerogative. It's my prerogative to determine the impact of the amended non-dissemination order on the Associated Press's First Amendment rights and whether the order is vague, overbroad, unduly restrictive, or not narrowly drawn. As outlined in the attached brief, this court should follow the reasoning of the Ninth and Second Circuits of uh, the Ninth and Second Circuits in Radio and Television News Association of Southern California versus U.S. District Court for Central District of California and in reapplication of Dow, Dow Jones and Company, Inc., even though the order might impact the press's ability to interview the parties subject to the order, this incidental impact does not amount to a prior restraint on speech. 
And then they go through the standards, balancing the First and Sixth Amendment interest. The amended non-dissemination order is not vague, overbroad, or unduly restrictive. I think it is a bit overbroad as it relates to the victim's families. Other than that, I don't think it is. I was teasing. It's a writ of mandamus. I said Matt Damon. The chat can chat about it. <laughs> uh, regarding the question of whether the order is narrowly drawn, neither voir dire, jury instructions, change of venue or postponement or sequestration of the jury could address the threat to judicial integrity posed by prejudicial, extrajudicial or prejudicial, extrajudicial statements. That applies to the attorneys involved in the case and law enforcement. And that's about it. So I, again, think that the proper result is going to be go back to the first order. So, and I think going back to the first order is fine. All right. I'm not going through all 26 pages of this because we have a bunch of other stuff. If you want me to go more in depth, it's going to be the exact same briefing that we got in the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, go back and do it again. I want to see this one. State's brief on video and photographic coverage. Way more interested in this. This is apparently what they're covering now uh, in court. Let's see, my Twitter stopped updating. Media attorney now asking this defense expert questions. You don't have to research for jury bias in your CV, correct? That was 30 minutes ago. My Twitter is not updating well at all. Um, so... Continued on cameras in the courtroom may reduce the number of media in courtroom because they need to use a pool feed. What cameras in the courtroom do. So it's the media is arguing over cameras in the courtroom at the moment, which is really helpful. All right, let's continue looking at this motion. I was just peeking in on what was going on around the tweet tweets. There's no way we're getting that video tonight before I have to go. All right. In the state's view, let me swoop. This is the state argument regarding cameras in the courtroom. I should have swooped and then given you the title. This is the state's argument regarding cameras in the courtroom. This is something that is being fought today in court live, literally now. State's brief on video and photographic coverage. In the state's view, the decision of whether to allow video or photographic coverage of the proceedings in this case is left to the sound discretion of the court. Oh, wise judge. Oh, wise judge. Please, please make the decision. Smart. Idaho Court Administrative Rule. I have no idea. ICAR 45. The courts have not held that there is a First Amendment or other constitutional right of the media to broadcast or photograph a proceeding. That's true. In fact, there have been circumstances where the United States Supreme Court has held that extensive broadcasting and photographing of a proceeding may be violative of the defendant's due process rights. That's that SD's case. Um, it makes me want to sing Taylor Swift um, or talk about SD's robberies. Those are two totally different things. Some of you will know what I'm talking about. As guidance, the state has attached the recent decision by the 7th Judicial just. Seventh Judicial District Judge Stephen Boyce in the state of Idaho versus uh, Lori Vallow. So the Vallow Daybell case. They are just leaning in. Look, Your Honor, they did it in Vallow Daybell. Do it. Do it. Do it now. Do it. I didn't say that very much like Palpatine, but I thought it in my head. I know it's five o'clock in Idaho. They're still going though. They are still going in Idaho. All right. The state would further note that federal rule of criminal procedure 53 prohibits courtroom photographing and broadcasting except as otherwise allowed by ruler statute in federal cases. I know it's so fucking annoying. Wait, this court in Idaho is on Pacific time. Ugh. Northern Idaho and PST, Southern Idaho and MST. Oh, they got an hour. Is Idaho split into two time zones? I mean, so's so's my state. It's um, it gets confusing. Like we're looking at going to Kentucky for something, and like where we're going is is just north of us, but it's EST and we're CST, and I'm like, what the, what the fuck is happening? Time zones. 
are confusing. Well, that explains why I keep getting time zones wrong. Yay, Idaho time zones. They've got an hour. The state would further note that the federal rule of criminal procedure 53 prohibits courtroom photographing and broadcasting except as otherwise allowed by rule or statute in federal cases. It's so annoying. The state also has the following concerns about allowing broadcasting or photographing at the trial in this case. Ugh. One, the state has a number of sensitive witnesses who would like, who would likely be intimidated, harassed, or harmed by a live broadcast of the trial. I'm going to need more information on that. Two, jurors, unless sequestered, would have off hours access to the broadcast, which may include discussion, which were outside the jury's purview. No. No. First of all, the jury is, there's going to be discussion on social media about this case, whether there's cameras or not. This is an argument that misses me completely. Whether there are, um, uh, whether there are cameras or not, this is a, a real concern. But the jurors, even when the jurors were sequestered in cases, they still have access to TV and the news is still talking about it. They're told not to go on it. And so they're told not to go on it. And that's the same in every single freaking case. Three, witnesses would have access to broadcasts showing the specific testimony of other witnesses. Yeah. And if they watch it, they get yeeted as witnesses. You can just give a sequestration order to the witnesses. That happens in every case. They can't sit in the courtroom. They can't watch. We saw it happen in Depp v. Heard. And Gina Duder's was yeeted from being able to testify. You've got to tell your witnesses. Every other case that's, tele that's televised works that out. That's a you problem. Tell them not to watch. And if you're really worried about it, bring them to your office and sit them in an office so they can't watch. Okay? So really, sensitive witnesses is a concern. However... Those sensitive witnesses will still have to testify in front of courtrooms full of people because the proceedings are always going to be open. So you can, I mean, you can't limit their names from being out there. You can limit their images from being out there, but you can't stop the media from being outside the courthouse photographing people coming and going. I mean, there's only so much you can actually limit and this isn't going to help. All right. I disagree with these prosecutors. I understand why they're doing it, but some of those arguments are not great arguments. Pending before the court is the defendant's motion to clarify media in the courtroom filed August 30th requesting cameras be banned from future proceedings. Hmm. On September 8th, several non-party media entities sought to obtain permission from the court to file as interested persons in response to defendant's motion, arguing the media has no time, wait, had it no time filed, uh, has at no time failed to comply with orders of this court governing media coverage in court. Footnote two. On September 12th, the state filed a concurrence with the defendant's motion. The state and the defense are asking to ban courtrooms from future proceedings. That's what's being argued today. That's not being decided today, but that's what's being argued today. This judge is going to issue written orders. That's what we saw him do in the last motion. That's what we're going to see him do in this motion. Uh, Chanley Painter's tweeted that already. So the judge is not going to order that today. But the defense and the prosecution are asking to ban courtrooms. or ban cameras in the courtroom. On September 1st, the state filed a concurrence. On September 15th, the court heard argument. Having fully reviewed the record, relevant rules, case law, and upon the request of counsel, this court enters the following order. So this is the Vallow Day Bell order. Oh, sorry. That's why I was so confused. I was like, have they really? Had I missed things? This is the Vallow Day Bell order attached. Okay. So the, sorry, ye, everything I said, the prosecution is arguing that the court should adopt the ruling from Valo Daybell and then attached the ruling from Valo Daybell and I zoom zoomed past this. 
So, um, that's the court. the The whole motion is adopt the Valo Debo ruling. All right. So, let's see. Uh, state's brief, we got that. That was kind of a weak brief. Stipulation for protective order, we got that. Notice of hearing, we got that. Order permitting remote participation at hearing, we got that. Order regarding notice of hearing, we got that. State's motion to temporarily seal, I covered. Reply memorandum on camera access in the courtroom, yes, please. This is from the media outlets. Lady Kirkpatrick said, we've had two very serious criminal trials that were streamed live, Murdoch and Brooks. There's been more. I don't like the argument of banning everything. Justice is blind as it should be. But why blind to the public? It shouldn't be blind to the public. And I agree with you. Um, Rittenhouse also gained quite a lot of attention. And Rittenhouse um, was, I think, a much more contentious case than these. There have been lots and lots. Uh, Casey Anthony. There have been lots of contentious, high-profile criminal cases that have had cameras in the courtroom. Lots and lots and lots. This is the media's response. The state, Mr. Koberger, and interveners share many views on audiovisual coverage of this case. All agree that the court should ultimate that the court ultimately has the discretion to decide whether to allow audiovisual coverage. Oh, Jody Harris, also a good one. Also a high-profile one. OJ, also a high-profile. Very high-profile. Probably one of the most high-profile criminal cases ever. All agree that the court ultimately has the discretion to decide whether to allow AV coverage. Nobody seems to dispute that most members of the impacted communities would be unable to observe the proceedings with their own eyes and ears absent AV coverage. Agreed. And that's why it was so important in Brooks. In Brooks, it was critical because the entire community that was impacted couldn't physically be in court. There wasn't enough court space. And that's the case here. You have an entire university that's impacted. You have an entire town and city that's impacted. There isn't enough room for every student impacted by this. There's four victims. So. Um. The friends of all the victims wouldn't fit in, you know? Nonetheless, the state flags some concerns about AV coverage while largely deferring to the court and Koberger more forcefully objects. I think that's a great summation. Idaho court administrative rule largely 45 largely addresses the concerns of the state and that the state and Koberger rise. Some witnesses may be acutely affected by AV coverage, but those concerns cannot be addressed or can be addressed as they come up on an individualized basis, that's true. The jury should hear only the evidence or arguments submitted to them, but Rule 45 regulates the AV coverage such that effectively only those aspects of the proceeding open to the public in the gallery are broadcast. Interveners, um, supplemental memorandum on camera access in the courtroom at page 6-7. Regardless of whether the court allows AV coverage, there is going to be large amounts of publicity surrounding the case. Yup. I feel like we're on the same page with this. There is no greater risk that potential jurors for pre-recorded for pretrial proceedings or jurors for trial will be unfairly biased if there is AV coverage, as any information shared in open court that is not broadcast may still be published by reporters who attend the proceedings. Yep. For that reason, the court will certainly instruct the jurors not to watch news coverage regardless of whether it allows AV coverage. Yep. AV coverage will not create a distraction in the courtroom. As Judge Boyce noted in the Vallow case, the court affirms that there is no indication that any orders relating to the conduct of the media during hearings in the case or the companion case have been violated. The court has likewise witnessed no misconduct on any part of the media during the hearings in these cases. The media tends to be really well behaved. They have a lot of money to stand to be made on this. And the media tends to want to consider to co continue to cover trials. Like, it's literally what court TV does. And I personally think they do it well. So, finally, interveners appreciate Koberger's concerns about how certain images have been used on social media. Welcome to the internet. 
internetting. Prohibiting AV coverage will not eliminate the concern, though, as those in the courtroom can publish similar statements about their observations of Koberger's appearance and demeanor. And you can also have court sketch artists. And people will look at the sketch and be like, he seems cold. And people will continue to make assertions about him based on his looks, his demeanor, the way he sits, how fluffy his eyebrows are or are not. Because that is exactly what people will do. We don't. We're not going to be like, oh, he looks like a this. He looks like that. I'm going to diagnose him with things. I'm going to reach in my DSM, flip it open and start picking out things. We don't do that here. But the internet, internets, and they're going to do it either way. And the media is not wrong about that. Would it be great if the internet was kinder? Maybe. Um, Kelly, I saw your point. Um, Nightbot and I get cranky about all caps, but I see your point that there might be operations going on still. None of this addresses that. So if you, I'll grab it if you ask it again with a question mark. Um, but this, none of the, none of this addresses that. So. Well, uh, let's see. To address Mr. Koberger's concerns while still allowing impacted community members to view the proceedings, the court could regulate how camera cap cameras capture Koberger. For example, allowing only wider shots or limiting how close a camera can zoom. Right? You can, like, use the text. Use the tech. What is more, a few selective examples are no reason to deprive all members of the impacted communities the opportunity to observe the proceedings with their own eyes and ears. Agreed. And again, once the jury is impaneled, the court can certainly instruct them not to consume any information. Yep. It's a good motion. To the point. I appreciate it. Very much to the point. They're like, look, you can work around all of these things. In the Brooks case, they did not televise the, the testimony of minors. They did not show them on screen. They did not show the photos from the crime scene or the autopsy on screen. They showed none of it in Brooks and they did a really good job with not showing it until one of the attorneys was like waving shit around. In Murdoch, there are ways to balance the defendant's Sixth Amendment rights, the dignity of the victims, and the need for the public to be allowed access, true meaningful access to a public trial. And we already saw Andrea Burkhart be asked if she would like give up her seat for media because people are trying to squish into this courtroom. But if you're one of the college kids who's friends with the victims, you have a right to be there without the media trying to push you out of the way. I think that the media, I think that court TV cameras, let me narrow that down. I think that court TV cameras have generally done a very good job of balancing the orders of the court and the desire of the public to see what is in court and the right, the right of the public to have an open court. So, um, at almost three and a half hours, you guys, I am going to have to bounce and have dinner with the family because it's Friday. Peace dog. I am hoping that this court, I am hoping that this court orders that there can be cameras and that they will continue to deal with the way that the cameras are allowed to cover things. Yeah, the Brooks trial was really good. The prosecution team was great. The camera coverage was good. The judge um, balanced the rights well. I think sometimes maybe it was a little too. But I think they did a good job. So where are we now? Oh, not there. Swoop. I meant to swoop. Where are we now? The court has had two hearings today on cameras in the courtroom, gag orders and such. The court has not ruled on any of them. The court is going to issue written rulings. I will cover the written rulings when they are available. The hearing this afternoon went on for multiple hours, and I will cover that on Tuesday. I'm sure a lot of you will have seen it by then. I will be breaking it down on Tuesday. Um, could I probably go live this weekend? No. We have family things to do. Um, so it will get covered on Tuesday. I am sorry for those of you that will have to wait for my coverage, but it will be available. I think probably late tonight, given how long it took for the other hearing to be available on the interwebs. So that will be available probably late tonight, if not tomorrow. 
and I will cover it. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about on Tuesday. And if there are more rulings, we will talk about them on Tuesday too. The court is issuing written rulings. We still don't have a ruling on all the Petito stuff either. So with that, I'm going to answer just a few more questions and then I'm going to bounce. I've got to start getting, we've got things to do. I have a very busy week next week and then I am off for a week because I will be at VidCon and I'm not going to be streaming while I'm at VidCon, but I will tell you that I will be creating some members only content while I'm at VidCon. I will be vlogging a little for our members only spaces while I'm at VidCon. I will be keeping you up to date on meetups with other creators, um, which creators I'm uh, which creators I'm seeing and not seeing some of the behind the scenes of the parties, et cetera, et cetera. So I am speaking at VidCon. I will be there for like the entire week and I will give you all the behind the scenes access that I have. I have access to all of the things. So if you guys know creators that are going to be at VidCon and you are curious about what that is like, um, I will be capturing that for you for that entire week. So there will be no streams, but there will still be content. Um, and that is, that is what we're doing. Mary P said, taking my son and hubby, well with hubby to see Dave tomorrow for his 18th birthday. That's so exciting. Happy Dave day to you. Happy Dave day to you. So I will post schedule the panels. They are up on the VidCon website. I speak on Friday. So that, um, so I will be capturing that kind of behind the scenes stuff. We have a members only live stream tomorrow. I will, um, I need to modify the time just a little bit. I need to bump it back. So I will update that in all your members spaces and we will be talking about all the things that we have been talking about. I will, if I do like a catch up on Deputy Heard, it will be after VidCon and that's everything. So there's a few more uh, chats from y'all that I didn't get to. So thank you for those. Izzy said ADHD tax was steep today. Oh no, I'm so grateful for the law nerds. You make days like this a million times better. Izzy, I'm sorry I've been there like in a million different ways. It's it's hard. Uh, Paula said so many people changed their minds and Debbie heard after watching the trial themselves. Mm -hmm. If only we relied on MSN, who knows? It's important. If courts open to the public, then open it to the public via cameras. I completely agree with you, Paula. I think federal courts should be open. I think it should be open. I think what's going on in our system should not be secretive. I don't think it should be secretive at all. It's an open system. Courts are open, except for juvenile court, which I think is fair. You can walk into court and see what's going on. So if you can do that, why not stream it? And I think that people might have more faith in our justice system if they could see it. Because imagine how you would feel if you only watched the media coverage of like a Depp v. Heard, and then you saw the jury verdict. And you were like, how the fuck did the jury get there? What is going on with the system? But then when there is time that the system isn't working, it's important to be able to see it. Most of the time, I look at a verdict and I'm like, I understand how they got there when I look at the evidence. And I think that's fair. We need, I think more often than not, juries get it right. And that's something that we need to remember. It can be difficult. But more often than not, juries get it right. And I think until you watch it and see it, you might not believe that. And that's okay. Watch it and see it. Paul, Paula said, how about no cameras until jurors selected? Then cameras once the trial starts. That's fair. Um, it is. It's nice to see the pretrial motions, but that's something the court could consider. There's still going to be pretrial coverage, but the court could consider it. Um, Rosalind, good to see you. I heard time zones were created because train stations would just post times based on their own clocks, no matter how slow. <laughs> Seems legit. I mean, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I'm curious as to the creation of time zones. Damn, I'm, I'm going to have to ask my kid. Kat said, are there legal consequences if a private person snuck in a phone and live streamed the trial? Yes. I feel like someone would do it regardless. Yes. If there's a prohibition on recording, there are criminal sanctions for that. Criminal, like jail time sanctions and steep monetary sanctions. So yes, there are. Um, transparency is massively important. It is. And whenever people are afraid of transparency, I have questions. I have questions. I have questions. If you're afraid of transparency in a court system, if you are afraid to let cameras into the courtroom, I have questions. There are ways to balance these rights 
We've done this before. This is not the first rodeo. This is not the highest of high profile cases. We know how this works. So let people see. I think they deserve to. Um, all right. With all of that chat, it has been a delightful three and a half hours with you. Thank you for joining me. I'm sure the hearing today will be like three hours. So we will stream that entire hearing with my commentary on Tuesday. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. I have so much I have to do this weekend. I know it's going to be hard not to stream tomorrow too. I get it, but I'm not. Raw, can I redirect to Rob? Yes, Lawn Lumber is getting ready for Friday night for FNF. Friday night fuck around. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. <laughs> Friday night fun and shit. The Friday night fuck around um, over on Lawn Lumber. And with all of that, I'm going to say goodnight. Thank you to the mods for riding an extra day today. I appreciate it. And I will see you soon. Thank you. Oh, I need to roll the outro. Don't forget to roll the outro, Emily. All right. Bye. You can find all the Law Nerd goodies at lawnerdshop.com. Connect with me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. And don't forget to check out my podcasts, The Emily Show and the new podcast, Quick Bits, summarizing everything I talk about on my Tuesday and Thursday live streams. You know, when you only have time for just the Quick Bits. <laughs>